talking about your valuation price. Section 15 is all about finding the value, determining the value. A sure short question in valuation is there. Simple straightforward question will be surely, surely, surely there in your valuation chapter. Now when you talk about your valuation chapter, few basic conditions for basic valuation. What is basic valuation? You are not touching valuation rules. You are within the section only. What are the conditions? Condition number one. Condition number one, it should not be a special notified case. If it is a special case, go to valuation rule. If it is a special case, go to valuation rules. Condition number two, price should be the sole consideration. Price should be the sole consideration. So, condition number one, it should not be a special case. Not should be a note, it should not be a special case. Condition number two, price should be sole consideration. Condition number three, it should be unrelated party transaction. If all these three conditions are satisfied, then you go with normal valuation. Then you go with normal valuation. It should not be a special case. Plus, price should be, what does it mean by price should be sole consideration? It means 100 percentage monetary consideration. 100 percentage and it should be unrelated party transaction. The transaction should be between two parties who are not related. Who are not? If they are related, doubt will come. Who are not related. If all these three are satisfied, if all these three are satisfied, then your assessable value will be equal to transaction value. Now, what is transaction value? This is what we are going to discuss here. Transaction value starts with Price paid or payable. Basic price paid or payable. That is, which means basic selling price or service charges. Basic selling price or service charges. Basic selling price or service charges. So, if you have to write your summary of transaction value, summary of transaction is selling price or service charges. Rather, before adding, we will talk about subtract something. Less. Discount. There are two types of discount. Discount given at the time of supply. Discount given after supply. Discount given at the time of supply subtracted. Discount given after supply also subtracted, but it will be subtracted later. It will not be subtracted immediately. In reality, it will be subtracted later. Discount given at the time of supply. There is only one condition that you have to take care. Now, what is that condition? Show it on tax invoice. Clearly show it on tax invoice. Display it on tax invoice. Show the discount on tax invoice. So, that should be selling price 100 rupees less discount 10 rupees. GSE will be only on 90 rupees. GSE will be only on 90 rupees. Show the breakup on tax invoice. Show the breakup on your tax invoice. Discount after supply, what will happen is, let us assume that 100 rupees is a price, 90 rupees, 10 rupees is a discount. GSC is on 90 rupees. But how difference, if discount is at the time of supply, tax invoice will be 100 minus 10, 90. GSC is on, transaction value is 90. Transaction value is, but if discount is after supply, then there are multiple conditions. There are multiple conditions. Condition number one. Discount should be in as per agreement which is at the time of supply. Agreement to give discount should be at the time of supply. Discount is given later on. But agreement to give supply, agreement to give discount should be at the time of supply. Second, second, discount should be linked to tax invoice. For giving discount, you should give a credit note which is linked to tax invoice. Because tax invoice will show 100 rupees. Now credit note will show 10 rupees, reducing the value 10 rupees. So it should be linked with tax invoice. It should be linked with tax invoice. Third, as a supplier, you are going to reverse output tax. Initially, you are paid output tax on 100 rupees. Assume that the rate of tax is 5 percentage. Initially, you are paid tax of you are paid tax of 5 rupees. Now you will reverse it. 
you will reverse 50 paisa how 50 paisa 10 rupees multiplied by 5 percentages so earlier you have paid 5 rupees now you are going to reverse 50 paisa you can reverse output tax you can reverse output tax but only and only if recipient reverses proportionate input tax rate supplier you i am government is talking to the supplier government is selling supplier no worries you reverse your output tax but make sure that your recipient reverses proportionate proportionate input tax credit proportionate input tax credit the point here is in both the cases in both the cases answer is the same you see both the cases you'll find the final answer the same in the first case if i tell selling price is 100 and discount is 10 discount is 10 so what would be the value what would be the value value would be 90 and if i tell rate of taxes 5 percentage if i tell rate of taxes 5 percentage what will be the tax 100 100 less 10 90 is a value everything is at the time of tax invoice itself everything is at the time of tax invoice itself this is the accessible value correct this is the accessible value what will be the gst gst will be 90 multiplied by 5 percentage 4.5 now what is happening here in the second case, if discount is after supply, same thing. Initially, SSL value is 100 in tax invoice and GST is 5 rupees initially. Right. Later point of time, later point of time, you reduce 10 rupees in credit note and GST is reduced by 0.5. Net effect is taxes 4.5 and the value is the only difference is the timing. This entire thing happens in the same time by way of tax invoice. Whereas in the second scenario, it happens separately initially by way of tax invoice 100 plus 5, then by way of credit note 10 plus 0.5. And there are multiple conditions. That discount, if it is given later on, agreement to give discount should be in the beginning. You may give discount later, but agreement to give discount should be in the beginning, at the time of supply. Credit note should be linked to tax invoice, normal point. And third and the most important condition, supplier, we are allowing you to reverse 0.5 output tax. Make sure that the recipient is reversing 0.5 ITC, 0.5 ITC. So net value is the same. Net tax the same the working of it is different but net value and net tax is the same and conditions are more if you are doing it later conditions are more agreement to give discount should be there at the time of supply your credit note should be linked to invoice and most important condition government is allowing supplier to reverse output tax but supplier should take care that his customer or recipient is reversing proportional idc if tomorrow customer does not reverse Proportion IDC, government will take action against recipient as well as supplier because government believed the supplier. Government believed the supplier. Now, please understand that discount can be of any type, any description. It can be cash quotient, can give you cash discount, trade discount, damage discount, uh, turnover discount, year end discount, differential discount to differential customer to one customer, 5 percentage discount to other customer, 10 percentage discount. Anything is allowed. The question might give you any type of discount. Don't see the type of discount. Don't see whether it is cash or trade or quantity or quality or year end discount or damage discount or compensation discount. Whatever name is the discount is allowed. It is allowed. Are you guys clear with this understanding? 
are you guys clear with this understanding what if the customer later point of time is not ready to pay partial amount or full amount can i give you credit note if i have sold the customer for 100 rupees plus gsc 5 rupees customer at later point of time is not paying part amount or is not paying entire amount can i give credit note can i call it as discount no why there was no such agreement not to pay at the time of supply and by the way this is not discount it is bad debts it is not discount it is can you give credit note for bad debts can you give credit note for bad debts louder not possible you cannot give credit note for if your customer or recipient is not paying you cannot tell this sad story to the government that i have paid gsc to you now customer is not paying a single paisa what to do government is not bothered supply happened yes gsc is paid yes customer is not paying you is your headache is your headache can you reverse that output tax no can you give that credit note no not possible not <coughs> now talking about additions this is all about your subtractions this is all about your subtractions agreement should be at the time of supply plus credit note should be there which is linked to tax invoice plus main condition recipient should reverse proportionate itc now what are the additions what are the additions few additions we have <laughs> discussed we'll try to consolidate it additions we are talking about your additions first when you talk about first point it is subsidy subsidy will be added back subsidy will be added back condition condition for subsidy to be added back condition number 1 subsidy should not be from government condition number 2 it should be directly linked to the price it should not be a general subsidy it should be a price linked subsidy unit linked subsidy for that transaction that subsidy should not be a general subsidy should not be a general subsidy right now look at the example carefully if i am selling something for 100 rupees if i am selling something for 100 rupees and i am giving lot of subsidies 2 rupees subsidy government is giving me 3 rupees subsidy my holding company is giving it 4 rupees subsidy a non profit organization is giving it 5 rupees subsidy government company is giving it government company is giving it plus 1 lakh general subsidy is given again by my holding company what is the assessable value this amount 100 rupees i am getting from my customer or my recipient what is the assessable value what is the assessable value you will start with what your starting point is what 100 rupees for sure you are going to add it that the customer has given in whether whether 100 rupees yes by by default you are going to add it whether 2 rupees you will add it no by government no 3 rupees will add it holding company yes 4 rupees will add it non profit organization yes 5 rupees will add it government is different from yes 1 lakh rupees will add it no it is not price. subsidy linked to the price or subsidy linked to that unit it is general subsidy you sell how much ever unit will give you the subsidy 
irrespective of your performance will give you this particular subsidy so it is not going to be added so what is the final answer what is the final answer 100 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 100 and interesting what if i change the question and subsidy i see plays with this emotions a lot of times this question was based on the concept that price is that excluding subsidy all these price is that excluding subsidy price is given excluding subsidy if price is given excluding subsidy what do you do price you get you get 100 rupees from the 100 rupees from the customer plus you get 3 4 and 5 therefore you get at the answer as 112 what if i change the question and i tell that price 100 rupees is including subsidy then what will do then what are you going to do you will start with 100 then what you will do minus minus this minus will not do because this is general subsidy it has got nothing to do with transaction so what will be the answer concept wise it is the same but working out wise it is different concept i have not changed the answer conceptually it is very clear that three rupees should be included four rupees should be included five rupees should be included and two rupees should not be included one lakh rupees should not be concept wise it is the same but if price is not including subsidy then you have to add those subsidies which conceptually have to be included if price is already including subsidy which means already it includes three four and five but it also includes two which should not have been included which should not have been removed you will not do anything with general thing general thing is general 98 at times question itself will not be clear so you have to make an assumption ica will also write they will write prices after adjusting subsidy. If it is including and excluding, you will write the answer. But after adjusting can be understood in both ways. After considering. After. See, after considering can be understood in. After considering subsidy could be. Without including subsidy. Or it can be with, after including. So, you have to write your note. Telling that what assumption you have made. What assumption you have. Are we guys clear with this understanding? That is all about your subsidy. That is all about your subsidy. What is the summary that you are getting now? Transaction value is equal to price or service charges less two types of discount. Add subsidy. Add obviously there are conditions for subsidy. Then add taxes. Add taxes. Taxes other than GST and other than compensation. So you cannot add GST itself. GST will not be on GST. GST will not be on GST. So if I tell that is tobacco, that is tobacco which attracts excise duty and GST, that is tobacco. Of the style, that is motor vehicle. If I tell that is air travel tax. So, if I tell tobacco 100 rupees, motor vehicle say will keep same 100 rupees for understanding purposes. I am not going with realistic numbers. Don't think there is a motor vehicle which motor vehicle 100 rupees and all. Forget about that. We are just into the concept. This is the price. This is the basic price or charges. Now, here in tobacco you have excise duty say 10 rupees. Motor vehicle say you have road tax say 10 rupees and air travel you have say air travel tax 10 rupees. What is the assessable value? What is the assessable value? What will be the assessable value? 110, 110, 110. 
ఉంటుంది సింపుల్ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఆన్ ఆల్ అదర్ జిఎస్సి విల్ కమింగ్ ఇయర్ సో జిఎస్సి విల్ బి వన్ టెన్ మల్టీప్లైడ్ బై ద రేట్ దిస్ ఇస్ వాల్యూ దిస్ ఇస్ దాట్ విల్ బి జిఎస్సి వాల్యూ మల్టీప్లైడ్ బై రేట్ వాల్యూ మల్టీప్లైడ్ బై సో దిస్ వుడ్ బి ద అసెసబుల్ వాల్యూ right but they have again clarified that gst will not be on income tax tcs income tax tcs so what is that clarification supposing that is income tax tcs selling price is 100 selling price is 100 your say income tax tcs is at 1 percentage and gst say 5 percentage so here they categorically and very clearly tell that now in this scenario first you have to calculate gst first you have to calculate so selling price is 100 then you have to calculate gst normally gst comes in the end but here gst has to be calculated first it will be 5 how it is 5 100 multiplied by 5 percentage then there will be income tax tcs which will be 105 multiplied by how this 105 comes it is because of income tax it has got nothing to do with gsc it is because of your income tax it is because of your income tax wordings income tax i am not going in depth about your income tax that you if you see your income tax wordings if you see your section 206 c 206 capital c you will find all the reasonings there right so it will be 1.1.05 the point here is normally normally gst comes in the end correct gst will be 110 multiplied by percentage in all the three cases in all the three cases gst would have been 110 value multiplied by percentage whatever percentage multiplied by percentage question will give you percentage but here first you calculated gst in all other cases first you calculated other taxes then you calculated gst but here first you worked out why first of all this tcs is not indirect tax it is direct tax second it is not at all tax reason is if i am collecting tcs for someone the opposite person will get in his 26 a's in income tax act which is like advanced tax for him assume that the opposite person does not have any income in that year he'll take the refund of that he'll take the it's not at all tax it's not at all first differentiating factor all these taxes were all indirect taxes whereas this income tax tcs is direct tax second these are all taxes levied and collected no refund but this forget about indirect tax or direct tax it is not even tax this will go in opposite persons advanced tax account 26a similar to advanced tax technically not advanced tax but similar to advanced tax and if the opposite person is not having any income in that year he'll get the refund so it is not at all tax differentiation factor now coming back here selling price less to subtraction add five additions out of five additions how many we have seen two what are they subsidy tax subsidy tax now next is we are talking about interest on delayed payment of consideration this is exactly opposite to discount this is exactly opposite to discount discount is reduction interest on late payment of consideration is addition for discount there are conditions for interest on delayed payment of consideration there are no conditions there are no conditions you will give debit note or supplementary invoice for discount you give for discount you give here you give debit note 
in discount you reverse aha uh -huh. supplier reverses output tax supplier supplier reverses output tax and recipient has to reverse proportionate same amount of itc same amount of see for supplier it is output for recipient it is supplier outward supply output recipient coming inside input so here supplier has reversing output tax and the condition is recipient you reverse input tax right? when you are giving debit note supplier will pay extra output tax supplier will pay extra recipient will take credit for sure but government is not giving any conditions when government gets tax, no condition. When government is telling that, oh, reversal is that, sorry, no, no, don't do reversal, this, that, take care of this, take, do this, do that, do that, everything, everything government starts selling. When there is all reversal, then government is worried whether there is agreement at the time of supply. Okay, okay. Whether you are giving credit note. Okay, okay, okay. Credit note has to be given within time. Okay, okay, okay. You are giving credit note, you will reverse output tax. Whether your customer will reverse input tax credit. If not, I will... Take action against you. Okay, okay. So, government is so much worried. But what is this? When it is getting more tax, interest on delayed payment of consideration, no worries. Chill. Right? Now, should I follow any conditions? No. Are you going to pay extra output tax or reverse tax? Extra output tax. Condition, no condition. Time limit, no time limit. Whether customer has to take credit necessarily, Government tells it is his wish. You pay extra output tax. Whether he is taking credit or not, it is none of your business. It is none of? But it was your business when it was all reverse. It was all reverse. So, this is interest on delayed payment of concentration. It is addition. It is exactly opposite to. So, why have you only connected to discount after supply? Because interest will always be after supply only by default. Why are you getting interest? You have said to your customer that pay within three months. If he is paying within three months, will he collect interest? If he is not paying within three months, he will collect. So that is the reason I have said that this is exactly opposite to what? Discount after supply. Interest on delayed payment of consideration will be after supply. Difference is one is reducing the value, one is increasing the value. Reducing the value has got a lot of conditions. Increase in value, no conditions. No conditions. And mind you, this interest on delayed payment of consideration is not interest on loan. Don't confuse it. It is, you are trying to get amount from customer. You have sold to the customer for say, 1 lakh rupees plus GST. Now he is not paying that amount within agreed credit period. Agreed credit period given to him. So you are taking interest. You are taking interest. It was never you gave loan. You sold a product to the recipient or customer and now he is not making the payment within time. What is interest on loan? You gave financial assistance, you gave a loan and you said that there will be interest. Both are very, 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 very different. Interest on loan is a separate supply, independent supply, exempt. Independent supply, exempt. Separate supply, exempt. Giving loan, mere transaction in money. Getting back loan, mere transaction in money. Getting interest is a separate Supply which is exempt. Rate of tax, zero. Interest on delayed payment of consideration has got nothing to do with loans and deposits. I have sold my goods or given my services. Recipient is not making the payment within the agreed period. Now he has to pay the payment with interest. So it is interest on delayed payment of my earlier consideration. Interest on delayed payment of my and it is not an independent supply. It is connected to original supply. It is connected to, I have supplied this entire IT product to my customer, telling that you have to make the payment within three months. So, supply is about what? Information technology, goods. Information technology, my customer did not make the payment within three months. So, my entire IT product was costing say 1 lakh plus GST. Now, I am getting interest for late payment, which is say 10,000. Now, this 10,000 is interest on delayed payment of consideration, not interest on loan. 
it will be added to the value of 1 lakh. It will be added to the value of whatever is the rate of tax on IT product. So, supposing the rate on IT product is 18 percentage, interest on delayed payment of consideration, 18 percentage. If it is having 5 percentage, interest on delayed payment of consideration, 5 percentage. If my IT product is having, original supply is having 12 percentage, interest on delayed payment of consideration, 12 percentage. If my main product, main supply, original supply is 0 percentage, interest on delayed payment of consideration, 0 percentage. It is not a separate supply. It is addition to value of supply which is already made. It is addition to value of supply which is already made. It is not a separate supply. It is not a separate supply. Are we clear with this understanding? What are the three additions? Subsidy, taxes, interest on late payment of consideration. Delayed payment of consideration. Now, the fourth addition. Payment by <laughs> recipient to third party on behalf of supplier on behalf of supplier very very important condition it should be on behalf of supplier i'll make it very 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 simple for you i have agreed to give you something for 10 lakh plus gst 10 lakh plus gst right in that project one part of the work I have given to someone else. Right. That someone else comes to your place and he does some part of the project. When he is leaving, he is asking for 1 lakh rupees. What will be your first reaction? Why? You will call me and tell that we have agreed that we will finally pay 10 lakh plus CST. And now this third person who has got no connection with me, he is coming to my place, doing some work and telling that give me 1 lakh. What I tell? Don't worry. Pay him 1 lakh. When you pay me, you don't pay me 10 lakhs. Plus GST, you pay me 9 lakhs. You pay me 9 lakhs. Will you pay now? Yes. Who are you? Recipient. Who am I? Supplier. Who is that person to whom you made payment of 1 lakh? So, recipient to supplier. How much you are going to give me? How much you are going to give me? Louder. Recipient to supplier, recipient to supplier, 9 lakhs is clearly included in value. Recipient to third party, 1 lakh, whether you paid on your own or you paid on my behalf. I, you paid on my behalf, whether that will be added to value? Yes. If you see the original understanding, what was the original understanding? The contract value is 10 lakhs. So, valuation will be again? So, recipient to supplier, 9 lakhs. Recipient to third party on behalf of supplier, add 1 lakh. So, total value will be 10 lakhs. Total value will be 10 lakhs. Fair enough. Fair enough. Because the starting point, the problem with this, many of you will be confused. The starting point is price paid or payable by recipient to supplier. The selling price or service charges, it goes this way. Paid by recipient to Paid by recipient to supplier is still 9 lakhs. Paid by recipient to supplier is still that 1 lakh has to be added separately. Now that 1 lakh has to be added separately. Are you clear with this understanding? Are you guys clear with this understanding? Right. If you are clear, answer me this. Selling price. Rather, we will take up this point in the end. Once we complete the last addition. Last addition, right? Residuary payments for anything done. Residuary payments for anything done. Any work. Any work. The only condition is it should be that work should be done at the time or before delivery or removal. Any work. It can be Selling price plus transportation, selling price plus insurance, selling price plus warranty, selling price plus uh, inspection, selling price plus testing, selling price plus uh, war uh, extended warranty. So, you can have a very breakup of invoice. Selling price plus transportation charges, insurance charges, warranty charges, guarantee charges, extended warranty charges, inspection charges, testing charges, commission charges. You can have plenty list. Question will give you all these terms. You need not be worrying about the term. 
the only thing that you used to ask is it incidental charges technically this recipe payment is called as incidental charges technically this is called as incidental charges for any work it can be transportation insurance loading unloading handling inspection testing commissioning erection installation it can be any work what is the only criteria at the time or before delivery or removal that should be the criteria you're going to add everything you're going to add everything the question might give you various charges and all these charges that i've said is the commonly asked questions transportation charges or freight charges or insurance charges or loading charges unloading charges handling charges or inspection testing erection commissioning or warranty charges guarantee charges extended warranty charges anything you not even break your head to remember it anything but it should be at the time or before delivery or removal now say for example that is selling price plus testing charges selling price plus testing charges selling price plus testing charges 110 110 110 right now selling price plus testing charges normally given in the second case selling price plus testing charges this testing charges is paid by the recipient to third party on behalf of supplier. This testing charges is paid by the recipient to third party. And this testing charges is paid by recipient to supplier himself. What will be the answer in the first case? What will be the answer in the first case? It is, what will be the answer, assessable value in the first case? Assessable value in the first case will be 100 plus 10. Reason, incidental, for adding 10 rupees, incidental charges. Second case, 100 plus 10. Reason, payment by recipient to? third party on behalf of supplier third case it's only 100 don't think that 10 rupees will escape gs internal no third party will have separate contract there are two contracts so third party will charge separate gse to the recipient they have separate contract as a supplier i don't know that my customer or recipient did a testing. First of all, I will never know my recipient did testing. Secondly, even if I know, I will not know with whom it did testing. Thirdly, even if I know that person with whom it did testing, I will not know what that person has charged from my recipient. And even if I know that this person did testing for my customer and this was the amount of charges, it is none of my business. It is none of my. These are all the permutation combinations, right? One by one, you have all these questions. Nothing to do. I got, I have got nothing to do with this third party charging separately from my recipient. They are having a private contract. Why should I get involved? Did I say that you have to pay him so much? Did my recipient go to that third party because of me? No. Even if I would have suggested, do, did I finalize the contract between them? No. It is an independent contract. Am I trying to tell that whether that 10 rupees will escape GSC? No. That 10 rupees will have GSC. But that's a separate contract. It is my supply will have only GSC on 100 rupees. When that 10 rupees is collected independently from third party to the recipient, that third party is a supply to my recipient. That's a separate contract. He'll pay separate GSC on the 10 rupees. Separate contract. The question is asked from my angle. From my angle, if the question is asked, I'll pay GSC only on 100. Whether third party will pay GSC? Yes. He'll pay GSC on 10 rupees. He'll pay GSC on. But in that transaction, that third party is a supplier and my customer is the recipient. That is a separate transaction. That is a separate transaction. 
Now, if you look at the entire understanding now, this is a summary of your transaction value. Summary of your entire transaction value. Right. So here you are talking about selling price of service charges. Then you are talking about discount, discount type 1, discount type 2, 3 conditions. Then you are talking about 5 additions. Uh, one being subsidy, one being taxes, one being uh, interest on late payment of consideration. The question might give you interest, the question might give you late fees, the question might give you penalty. Whatever name they give, it's not. It is for late payment of consideration. For delayed payment of, we are not talking about interest on loan. We are talking about interest or penalty or late fees for delayed payment of consideration. Then you are talking about third party, recipient to third party on behalf of supplier on behalf of finally incidental charges incidental this is very simple and efficient way to understand your valuation value and if you club all these points you get a question i say we'll take four five points from this we'll give a question and you have to try to work it out now the only thing that you need to take care in this question, first catch point is subsidy. And I have said you what will happen with subsidy. You have to read question carefully to understand whether you have to add it or subtract it. Correct? Correct? Second important point is all about interest. Why it is all about interest is supposing the question gives you selling price and uh, say subsidy by other than government and say you're talking about incidental charges and say interest on late payment of consideration delayed payment of consideration selling price 1 lakh subsidy 20,000 incidental charges 10,000 interest on delayed payment of consideration 15,000 and the GSC rate on that main item is 18 percentage. What is the assessal value? What will be the assessal value? Your assessable value will be 1 lakh plus 20,000 will be added other than government plus 10,000 will be added. But this interest on delayed payment of consideration. Supposing you have charged 15,000 but the customer has given only 10,000. What you have demanded is 15,000 doing the proper calculation. But the customer said, no, 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 it is too high. I had this difficulty, that difficulty, right? So, and he finally receives only 10,000. What will be the addition? Normally, what you receive is not relevant. What you receive is none of government's headache. Government tell if you are not able to receive it, it's not my headache. If you don't receive 1 lakh, whether the government will forget 1 lakh? No, government will tell whether the customer is paying or not. You have to pay GSC on 1 lakh. Same is true with 20,000, same is true with 10,000. But for interest, GSC will be only on 10,000. This is discussed in time of supply. Because time of supply for interest on delayed payment of consideration is only when you receive it. Only when you? And how much you are going to receive it? 10,000. So it is only on 10,000. So first thing is, what is being demanded and what is being received, what you will consider? What is being received? IC has never asked both things together. They have asked two things separately, but I am merging both. The first thing is, what is demanded? Ignore it. What is received? Focus on it. Second thing, for some reasons, best known to ICI, I don't buy that point, but best known to ICI, you go with ICI answer. They always think that interest is always including GST. So what they will do, they will tell that this is inclusive of GST, therefore they will multiply it by 100 divided by 100 plus rate of tax. This will be a final answer. Obviously, with the help of calculator, checking calculator twice because you don't even trust your calculator, you will get the answer. You will get the answer. What are the two important things that we are doing? And this is only and only for interest. It is not applicable for any other any other addition. All other addition, whether you receive it or not, it is included in value. 
and full amount is included in value. But for interest, two important points. What is being asked is not allowed. What is being received is, if you don't receive any interest, zero. And what is being received, that is not the final answer. Multiplied by, multiplied by, after you take that figure, multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus rate of tax. Because ICI for some, some reasons, I don't know. It's paka wrong. I can certify it. But for exam, it is right. For exam, this is only way out. Divided by 100 plus rate of tax. So I say always believe that interest when it is received, it is including, it is including, customer will not be ready to pay GST separately. But practically what happens? Supplier will give interest debit note plus GST on that. And there is no even loss for the recipient. Why? Supply will pay extra output tax, recipient will take extra IDC. If you are doing this calculation, you are losing some interest. Because within that interest, you are going to pay GST. From within that interest, you are going to pay GST. This is against the concept of indirect access that you are shifting the burden. Here it is assumed that on interest, GST burden cannot be shifted. On all other things, you can shift the burden, but on interest, you cannot shift the GC burden. So, that is some understanding. Clear? Clear? Obviously, this all these items will be in tax invoice. That is a separate thing. All these things will be in tax invoice. This will be separately given in debit note. All other things. Subsidy from... I said something that practically it will not happen. But from your exam point of view, they are telling that debit note will have only 10,000 and within that you have to pay GST. The question will never give you a tax invoice debit note. Question will only ask valuation. So when they are asking valuation, this will be a final answer. So question focuses on valuation because there is a timing difference. 1 lakh plus 20,000 plus 10,000, you have to pay GST at earlier point of time. On this 10,000 multiplied by 100 divided by 118, you will be paying GSE at later point of time. That will happen later. So, timing difference, time of supply will be there. Different points will be there. There will be different point of time of supply. This will be, this documentation difference is not only there. There is one more difference. This will be one time of supply for these elements. There will be another time of supply for, if you link multiple chapters, GSE is beautiful. So, for other items, that is tax invoice. For this interest, debit note. For other items, all the other items including selling base, that's another one time of supply. E you have to pay tax at earlier stage. For this interest on delayed payment of consideration, you're going to pay tax at later stage. Later stage. That will be the right. So for interest, you need to understand it. Now, any permutation combination, any ICA question, take any random question of ICA from evaluation chapter. You will get right answer. I will not certify you will get right answer. I will change my words. You may go wrong. But when you see where you have gone wrong, you will understand that exact point where you went wrong. Because everything is there in this discussion that we had. So I remove that certification that you will get the right answer. But I certify that after you commit a mistake, when you see the answer, you will exactly know what mistake you made. Right? That is everything about your basic valuation. Basic valuation. Now moving on to your valuation rules. Now when are you going to go for valuation rules? When the conditions are not satisfied, you are going to go for valuation rules. When is rule 27, 28, 29 applicable? Rule 27 is applicable when there is non-monetary consideration, whether partly or fully. 28 is applicable when the transaction is between related person or distinct person other than principal agent. And 29 is when the transaction is between principal and agent. 27, 28, 29. 27, non-monetary consideration. 28, related party transaction, related person or distinct person. 29, principal agent. Principal agent. 
the moment you understand your 27 28 29 is automatic now what is 27 27 tells that there is supply being have supply there and the consideration that is paid by the recipient is either partly non-monetary or fully non-monetary which means you are having difficulty in valuation you go to valuation rule in 27 there are four steps first step go with open market value go with now you may ask what is this <coughs> open market value you see the definition of your open market value open market value is given here open market value is identical goods ditto copy paste everything is the same in customs you have this term as identical goods in gsc you have called as open market value just recall in customs it is identical goods here it is called as open market value ditto open market value of a supply means full value in money excluding gsc because value excludes gsc it includes all other taxes other than gsc where the supplier and recipient are not related because you are referring to other transaction please understand that in valuation rules you start referring to for your answer you refer to other person. it's just like a case where you don't know the answer you refer to the previous person so you are referring to someone else when you're referring to someone else at least that someone else should be logical otherwise it doesn't make any sense so you're referring to a transaction where the transaction between unrelated person price is the sole consideration happening at or about the same time when your transaction happened when that particular transaction happened so you're referring to the value of identical goods or identical services technically it is in gs it is called as open market value open market value what if you fail to find open market value so when it is possible it is possible in cases where you are dealing with customized item or you are dealing with that item for the very first time then your open market value is not possible it's not possible then you go to the next step step number two you what you do you add monetary consideration plus money value of non-monetary consideration monetary consideration plus money value of non-monetary considerations so supposing i have supplied you something and you have given me one lakh in money plus you have given me something in kind sir a laptop a new laptop so i will take the value as one lakh plus monetary value of a laptop monetary value of the laptop now if that laptop is new i can easily find out the market value or the money value of the non-monetary consideration i'll get the answer here i'll get the answer here but what if the laptop that you have given is a second hand laptop it's very difficult to find market value of the money value monetary value of the non-monetary consideration then you resort to the third step what is the third step you refer to value of uh, supply of goods or services of like kind and quality lkq you refer to like kind and quality goods or sources which in customs language is nothing but similar goods in customs language it's nothing but what is value of like kind and quality so when you're talking about supply of goods or sources of like kind and quality means any other supply obviously when you're trying to value under valuation rules you're trying to refer to some other value so any other value of goods or sources made under made under made under in customs what is this lkq called as so made under similar circumstances where the characteristics quality quantity functional components Im materials importantly even the reputation even the reputation is very important criteria other things might be satisfied in number of cases right starting from your features characteristics quality quantity functional components materials may match in other cases also but what may not match is the reputation are same or closely or substantially resembling initially they start with same then slowly they come tell okay it, if it's not same then don't worry it should be it should be closely or substantially resembling which means they are focusing on identical or similar uh, is the focus on exact same or somewhat similar so here there are two indications to tell that this is nothing but similar goods of your customs similar goods of your customs right so you refer to that 
finally assume that you don't have identical goods or services you don't have monetary value of non monetary consideration you don't have like kind and quality which means you don't have omb you are not covered by step 2 you are not even covered by step 3 what is the last resort final resort you take the amount that is received in money in our example take that 1 lakh and find the market value of non monetary consideration till now you'll tell that sir step 2 and step 4 are the same no but now that is the difference you are trying to find out the money value of non monetary consideration taking the help of step 31 taking the help of rule 30 31 what is rule 30 110 percentage of cost what is rule 31 best judgment whatever value you trying to figure it out roughly some value you clearly find out that when you are going down the steps the quality of the value decreases the quality of the value by default the moment you are enter into valuation rules it is not accurate value it is approximate value as far as you are under section 15 it was accurate value the moment you enter valuation rules be it rule 27 28 29 30 31 your shift focus your focus is shifting from accurate value to approximate value in approximate value in rule 27 step number 1 give you gives you more approximate value the moment you come to step 2 step 3 step 4 the approximate value quality decreases the quality of the approximate value decreases what are the four steps step 1 OMV two, monetary consideration, market value of non-monetary consideration three, LKQ four, monetary consideration plus market value of the monetary value of non-monetary consideration based on rule thirty thirty one. Right, these are the four steps. The moment you understand your rule twenty seven, twenty eight, I mean two twenty seven, twenty eight and twenty nine are obvious. What is twenty eight when twenty eight is uh, covered? related party transaction or distinct person transaction in that case do one thing take the four steps of 27 remove the second step remove the so what will be the answer step 1 what is step 2 lkq what is step 3 3031 here there is no monetary plus non monetary so, rule 30 31 30 31 is so, rule 30 31 Four steps of Rule Twenty Seven. Remove the second step. You will get the answer of Rule Twenty Eight. Three steps of Rule Twenty Eight. Remove the second step. What is Rule Twenty Nine? By the way, Principal Agent. Step One. Remove the second step. Step Two. Rule Thirty. So if you take the four steps of Rule. 27 remove the second step you will get rule 28 three steps of rule 28 remove step number 2 you will get rule 29 you will get rule 29 that's a very simple way to understand your 27 28 29 but wait 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 there are some special points in 28 and 29 both in 28 as well as in 29 you have something called as optional valuation this optional valuation this optional valuation is applicable only and only for 28 and 29 it's not applicable for 27 which means in 28 and 29 either you go with the three steps or the two steps as given in 28 29 or forget the three or the two steps respectively and go with optional valuation what is optional valuation optional valuation is taking the next person selling price your second person's selling price and multiplied by 90 percentage but there is a limitation for the optional valuation what is the limitation it is applicable only for goods second limitation it is applicable only if the next person in line if i am trying to find out my value now i am going to find out my value based on the next person's selling price so first it is only applicable for goods second the next person in line should be only a trader the next person in line should be only a you are trying to find out my value my i can be a manufacturer or trader but the next person in line should be only a trader not the supplier we are not talking about the supplier you are talking about the next person in line which means customer of the supplier who is selling further that person should be a trader now take his selling price multiplied by multiplied by 90 percentage and find the answer supposing supposing 
you are talking about related person. I am selling, the supplier is selling to related person and related person is further selling to unrelated person or principal is selling to agent, agent is further selling to, agent is further selling to unrelated person. By the way, agent here we are talking about as normal agent or special agent. The agent here discussed in your rule 29, the focus is on normal agent or special agent. We are trying to talk about special agent. For normal agent, all these difficulties are not at all there. For normal agent, the transaction is between agent to principal, commission, principal to customer, selling price. This difficulty does not come. When the difficulty comes, special agent, principal to, principal to special agent. There is no actual supply. There is, uh, there this application will come. The agent that is focused here is not a normal agent. The focus is on, the focus is on special agent as per your schedule 1. Where the deemed supply concepts hits in. For a normal agent, you will never enter valuation rule. Agent to principal. Agent to principal, commission, everything is satisfied. Unrelated person, price is the sole consideration, not a special case. Transaction value. Principal to customer, everything is satisfied. Unrelated person, price is the sole consideration, not a special case. You will not even enter valuation rule. So, this agent is not a normal agent, it is a special agent. Now, coming back here, in your rule 20, rule 28, here we have taken the example of related person. It can be even applicable for distinct person, branches. And here you have taken the example of 29. Our focus is to understand optional valuation. The difficulty here is, you are finding it difficult to find accessible value for the supplier in the first case and principal in the next case. But the related person to unrelated person, there is a sale happening. The sale happening is say for 200 rupees. For him, and here also we will take the same number, 200 rupees. For him, accessible value is not at all a question because it is under section 15, answer is 200. Accessible value is not at all a question because it is under section 15, answer is. The difficulty is for the first case where if at all you are having transaction between related person, the valuation is no, under rule 28. Here the valuation is under rule 29, principal agent. For them, there is a problem. They have an option. Either to go with three steps of rule 28 or two steps of rule 29 or to go with. Now, we are trying to understand only option valuation. Optional valuation, what they will do? They will take the next person selling price multiplied by multiplied by 90 percentage. Optional valuation. The condition for optional valuation is. The transaction should be only only pertaining to goods. Second, this related person or agent should be only a trader. He should not be a manufacturer. He should supply the goods as such. The supplier or the principal can be anyone. They can be manufacturer or they can be trader. But they are taking their value based on the next person. The next person should be a trader. So There are two criteria for your option valuation. It is applicable only for goods and the person whose selling price you are taking and multiplied by 90 percentage, he should be a trader. He should be a trader. This optional valuation is applicable only, only for good sector. Only, only for good sector. And that too it is applicable if the next person in chain, based on whom you are trying to find your value, should always be a trader because you should supply that item as such. As such. You can be a manufacturer, you can be a trader. So, supplier is not a problem. The next person in chain should be a trader. Optional valuation. Optional valuation. When I tell optional valuation, they had an option. They had an option. In rule 28, they had an option to go through the three steps of rule 28, which they ignored and they went for optional valuation. In rule 29, they had the option to go with Two steps of rule 29 which they ignored and they went for optional valuation. That is that. So, these two rules have something special called as 
ऑप्शन वैल्यूशन ना वन मोर स्पेशल पॉइंट इन ओनली एंड ओनली इन रूल ट्वेंटी एट ओनली एंड ओनली इन रूल ट्वेंटी एट वेन यू सी द्री स्टेप्स रेगुलर वैल्यूएशन नॉट ऑप्शन वैल्यूशन रेगुलर वैल्यूशन रूल ट्वेंटी एट हेज गॉट हाउ मेनी स्टेप्स फोर माइनस सेकेंड स्टेप थ्री स्टेप्स इन द फर्स्ट स्टेप दर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड एस दर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड एस डीम्ड ओपन मार्केट वैल्यू इफ द रेसिपियन विच इज my related person or my distinct person is eligible for full itc then i can give any value that will be treated as deemed open market value but the condition is my related person or my distinct person should be eligible for full input tax credit full itc then any value i give will be treated as deemed open market value this concept is applicable only only for rule 28 Not applicable for twenty seven, not applicable for rule twenty nine. There is something called as deemed open market value in rule twenty eight. It is not the third valuation. There are only two. Twenty seven only one valuation, four steps. Twenty eight, two valuation, regular valuation, optional valuation. In regular valuation, first step is open market value. There you have a special point called as deemed open market value. The recipient is eligible for. Full IDC, twenty nine, two valuation, regular valuation, two steps, optional valuation. There you don't have the concept of deemed open market value. Deemed open market value concept is only, 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 only for rule twenty eight related person or distinct person transaction. Are you guys clear with this understanding? That is all and all about your everything about your twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, twenty. Seven only one valuation four steps twenty eight regular valuation optional valuation regular valuation three steps first step is having a special thing called as deemed OMV deemed OMV if the recipient is eligible for that's a condition if the recipient is eligible for full IDC and twenty nine two valuation regular two steps optional valuation again there you don't have any concept of deemed OMV deemed OMV is not there in twenty seven and Twenty nine. It's there only in twenty eight. Now, once you go through all the steps, if at all you are not able to find the answer, then you are going to go to thirty and thirty one. Basically, most of the answers you'll get in twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine. But at times you'll not be finding answer in twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine. You have to resort to thirty. Classic example is if at all you are giving gifts of free samples to unrelated person. Gifts of free samples to. Is it non monetary consideration? No, there's no consideration at all. Forget about monetary or non-monetary. So twenty-seven is not covered. Tata Limited is giving gifts of free samples to its customers. Tata Limited has taken ITC, so it has to pay output tax. For valuation for Tata Limited, will it go for twenty-seven? No, because there is no consideration. Forget about non-monetary consideration. Will it go for twenty-eight? No, because the transaction is between Tata Limited and unrelated person. Will it go for twenty-nine? No. There's no transaction between principal and agent. So, what is the rule that it will select? Rule thirty. So, when you select rule thirty, it is hundred and ten percentage of cost. If it is manufacture, hundred and ten percentage of cost of manufacture or production. If you are a trader, hundred and ten percentage of the cost of acquisition. If you are a service provider, hundred and ten percentage of the cost of provision of services. It is hundred and ten percentage of cost. Manufacture means. Cost of production, trader means cost of purchase or cost of acquisition, and service provider means cost of service. And what is rule thirty one? If at all you are not able to even find the answer there, best judgment assess valuation. Reasonable means rough valuation. There is no other option. Best judgment valuation. Always when you talk about service sector, they have a soft corner. What is the soft corner? If at all. If at all you are not able to find out cost, forget rule thirty. Go directly with thirty one. For a trader and manufacturer, it is rule thirty then thirty one. For a service provider, you can ignore rule thirty directly apply. For a trader and manufacturer, try rule thirty then go with thirty one. But for a service provider, ignore rule thirty directly. You can go with Directly you can go with. So for a service provider, they tell that you may directly opt for thirty one. For a trader and manufacturer, they tell that no, no, 
first try 30 if not successful try 31 so that is all about your normal valuation rules now moving on to the second part of your valuation rule special valuation rules special valuation rules focuses only on 31a and 32 31a only focuses on your actionable claim 32 different sectors special valuation rules will give you direct different formulas and understand that if you are lucky enough you will get two valuation question in your exam paper one based on section 15 27 28 29 30 31 are never touched mostly because the moment you see the question question itself will have an answer question by default if you remember the steps question itself will have an answer they will focus on special valuation rules 31a and 32 more importantly 32 right now what is 31a and 32 special valuation rules for special sectors for actionable claim they have 31a for lottery there is one formula for get betting gambling which includes horse racing for betting gambling betting includes horse racing there is a special, special formula for lottery what is the formula that they give what is the value for lottery the value is face value of the ticket or price notified by the organizing state in the gazetteer whichever is higher the face value of the ticket or the no, price notified by the organizing state whichever is but that is not the final answer multiplied by 100 divided by 128 simple understanding come tax calculation the rate of tax is 28 they know that the amount which is collected from the customer in case of lottery includes gst separately gst will not be collected so first why want to find out city the take the face value of the ticket see the price notified by the organizing state whichever is higher take that answer that is not the final answer multiplied by 100 divided by 130 128 now when you talk about betting gambling and horse racing so you can clearly find out the difference poor people rich people poor people's time pass of money rich people's time pass with money poor people with an expectation that they'll become richer soon richer people with an expectation that they will become more richer reality nothing is achieved right clearly if at all you try to bifurcate it clearly you can visibly see that particular point when you talk about lottery it's very common for a poor person obviously rich person will also take i'm not trying to but what is a normal practice out of the savings they'll try to put something in lottery expecting that something special will happen and at one point of time they'll get a big lottery and which happens in many occasions but when you talk about betting gambling and horse racing, i'm not talking about a person who's uh, having a kind of addiction if you're addicted even if whether you're rich or poor will do it but when you're talking about the normal categorization betting gambling or racing it is a game or gamble which is taken by rich persons there what is the answer it is the face value of the bet or the amount paid in total is it it's not which are higher because either or it will be there either you put your bets in the automated machine totalizer value or if at all it is not by an automated machine manually tickets are issued then you cannot rely what was the value therefore they go with the face value of the ticket it is not whichever is higher it is either or no come tax calculation why rich in addition to it collect gst in addition to it collect gst for poor person the final amount which will be collected is the final lottery ticket value they will not collect GSE in addition to it. Therefore, they are required to do come tax calculation. Here, there is no requirement of come tax calculation. You have come here for becoming more rich. Why not pay extra tax? Why not pay extra tax? Pay tax. This is the value. On that, you pay tax. That is all about your rule 31A. 31A is over. Lottery on one part. <coughs> betting gambling, <coughs> including horse racing on the second part. Now we are fo focusing on 32. Different sectors are covered that. Different different sectors are covered that. Though there are examples given here, I will only tell the concept. We are going for a fast track revision, marathon revision. We will not be seeing the examples. Focus on the concepts that we have already discussed. So only focus on the concepts. One first is for money changer. For money changer. Basically, you are talking about banks and authorized dealers. So when you are talking about money changing, banks and authorized dealers, they have two options. 
ऑप्शन वन रूल थर्टी टू टू ए ऑप्शन टू रूल थर्टी टू टू बी एंड ऑप्शन वन एक्सरसाइज कैन नॉट बी विड्रॉन ड्यूरिंग द बैलेंस पार्ट ऑफ द इयर सो टिल द इयर एंड यूर टू बी इन दैट ऑप्शन टिल द इयर एंड यूर टू बी इन दैट पर्टिकुलर ऑप्शन वॉट इज ऑप्शन वन ऑप्शन वन इज वेरी नॉर्मल ऑप्शन यू आर ट्राइंग टू फाइंड आउट द मार्जिन प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड दैट दीज मनी चेंजेस बीट बैंक और ऑथराइज डीलर्स इफ एट ऑल आई गो टू अ बैंक और ऑथराइज डीलर एंड इफ आई वॉन्ट से हंड्रेड डॉलर्स and the dollar value is rupees 80 dollar value is rupees 80 i end up paying 81 now understand that the margin of the bank or the authorized dealer is only rupee 1 rupee 1 per dollar multiplied by 100 dollars 100 that 80 rupees transaction to put in a simple manner i have totally paid 8100 for 100 dollars Where the RBI rate was rupees eighty per dollar. In reality, I should have paid only eight thousand. How much I ended up paying eight thousand one hundred. I can bifurcate this into two. The first portion in mere transaction in money, no GST. The second portion is service charges related to transaction in money. So the first portion will not have any tax. The second portion will have tax. This is only to tell you that. Service charges a small portion. Service charges a out of this total transaction, which is worth eight thousand one hundred. The value is only hundred. And please, please mind you. Be it normal valuation rule or special valuation rule, we are trying to find out the value, not the GST. So this hundred rupees is not the GST. This hundred rupees happens to be the assessable value. All the rules, not only this rule, all the rules. What are answers we are trying to find? It is accessible. After that, you will take the rate and find out the GST. If you understood, understand, understand this particular point, what will be the normal case? If one of the currency is Indian rupees and there is a RBI reference rate which is available, the answer, example that you have taken. What you have to do? You have to subtract the RBI rate with the buying rate or the selling rate, multiply by the number of foreign currency. You will get the answer. You will get the service charges. In our example, we got hundred. What if one of the currency is Indian rupees, but RBI reference rate is not available? We will take the same example. Eight thousand one hundred I paid, but RBI reference rate is not that. I don't know what is the range. In this case, I had an RBI reference rate. So what I did? This answer how I got? It is rupees eighty one per dollar minus the RBI reference rate eighty per dollar. Multiplied by number of dollars, and that is the reason I got this hundred rupees. Correct, correct. This is the other way to calculate it. I got this hundred rupees by taking the buying rate minus the RBI rate multiplied by the number of dollars, the margin. Because I had the benchmark rate to compare my margin. What if I tell that in the same example, in the same eight thousand one hundred, I took eight thousand, I took, I got hundred dollars. By paying eight thousand one hundred, but I now RBI reference rate is not available. I don't have the benchmark. What to do? One percentage. One percentage is a deemed margin. So take that one percentage of gross amount in Indian rupees. In our example, that one percentage will be of eight thousand one hundred, which is eighty one rupees. Which is eighty one. That will be the answer. That will be the answer. In the first case, our answer was hundred. In the second case, answer will be. Eighty-one, eight thousand one hundred multiplied by one percentage. What if both the currencies are foreign currency? What if both the currencies are foreign currency? Dollars for pounds or dollars for yen? What to do? First, convert both of them into Indian rupees by multiplying by the RBI reference rate. Convert that dollar. Supposing hundred dollars exchanged for say. One twenty pounds. Let us forget about the reality rates. Just some numbers. So hundred dollars converted to rupees by taking the RBI reference rate. One twenty pounds converted into rupees by taking the RBI reference rate for the pounds. You'll get both in rupees. Take one percentage of that. One percentage of that. Supposing dollars into rupees, you get eighty one thousand. Pounds into rupees, you get eighty-three thousand. So one percentage of that is one percentage of that is eight, ten, and 
8:30. Which hour is? So answer will be 8:10, not 8:30. Normally, government has got this bad habit of telling which hour is higher. Maybe by negligence here they have said which hour is lower. So their focus is on 8:10. Convert both the foreign currency into Indian rupees by RBI reference rate multiplied by one percentage because margin will be very small one percentage. We will get now two answers. Take whichever is, take whichever is, that will be the final valuation answer. This is, I repeat, this is not GST, this is only accessible value. This is option one. Option one, multiple scenarios possible and answers giving given. Option one, totally how many scenarios are there? Totally how many scenarios are there? Scenario one, case one, case two and case three. In option 2, you have only one scenario. You are not discussing about three scenarios. You are discussing only and only about one scenario. Where you tell that, forget about everything. Whatever you have exchanged in Indian rupees, focus on that. Whatever you have exchanged in Indian rupees, focus on that. You would have either paid Indian rupees or you would have either got Indian rupees. Either paid Indian rupees to get foreign currency or got Indian rupees by selling foreign currency. Focus on that Indian currency. Take that Indian currency and apply your income tax slab wise calculation. Here you have to work like your income tax slab. What is that income tax slab? Supposing total amount that you have exchanged in Indian currency is 1 crore 10 lakhs. 1 crore 10 lakhs. What you have to do? For the initial 1 lakh. For the initial 1 lakh. 1 percentage. For 1 lakh to 10 lakhs, which is next, 9 lakhs, it is 0.5 percentage. For the balance, for the balance, 1 crore, 0.1 percentage. What is the answer that you will get? For the first 1 percentage, you will get 1000. Next, 4500. 4, and next, you will get how much? 10,000. Totaling to? 15,000. This is your accessible value. You don't have multiple cases. This is only a single case. Unlike your option 1 where you have different cases, different answers. Here there is only one case. You are working like your income tax lab. Right. For the initial 1 lakh, 1 percentage. See, very simple understanding. The more the value, the margin will get decreasing. That is the understanding. Uh, 1 lakh to 10 lakh that is next 9 lakhs 0.5 percentage more than 10 lakhs 0.1 percentage is your margin take totally check your answer if at all the answer is lesser than 250 bring the answer as 250 if the answer is lesser than 250 bring the answer as 250 if the answer is more than 60,000 bring the answer as 60,000 the range should be between the range should be between 250 to 60,000. The lower limit and the upper limit. If you get an answer which is less than 250, bring it to 250. If you get an answer which is more than, here we got an answer which is between 250 and 60,000. If you get an answer which is less than 250, bring the answer to 250. If you get an answer which is more than 60,000, bring it to 60,000. Again, again, again. These are all nothing but Accessible value, not the tax. Not the tax. That is for your money changer. First option, three scenarios. Second option, one scenario working like your income tax lab in three parts. In three parts. Now the other special cases. For air travel agent. For air travel agent. If at all air travel agent is booking your ticket for domestic travel, domestic bookings, accessible value will be equal to 5 percentage of basic fare. If at all, if at all, he is booking for international travel, international bookings, accessible value will be 10 percentage of the base fare. This base fare is nothing but the only base fare which will not include other charges. It will not include other charges collected by airlines. It will not include taxes, especially there for airlines. It is only basic FAR. Airlines may collect basic FAR plus other charges and all. But calculation for air travel agent will be 
If it is domestic booking, 5% of the basic fare, the base amount, not extra charges. International booking, 10% of the basic fare, not the extra charges. Mind you, this valuation is for our travel agent, not for the airline company. For the airline company, section 15. Basic fare plus other incidental charges plus other taxes other than GST. As is base fare plus other charges, incidental charges collected by the airline plus travel tax. Because the airline will also have travel tax. This will be the value for the airline company. Airline, but we are focusing on what? Air travel agent. 5% of the base fare for domestic bookings, 10% of the base fare for international booking. One was for actionable claim, betting gambling lottery, 31A, 32, 2 was for money changer, 32, 3 is for air travel agent, 32, 4 is for your life insurance company. This time it is not for life insurance agent. This time it is for life insurance company. Life insurance company. If at all you have seen the different premium premium types while doing your audits for your client and all, you will understand how they work. They have various different policies. Policy 1, policy 2, etc. Right? Lots of policies. Highly innovative sector. They will create a new policy based on your requirement nowadays. Right? So when you talk about these policies, that is the premium contains a risk portion and the Savings portion. Please understand that the saving portion is nothing but mere transaction and money, which is not subject to GST. Risk portion will be attracting GST. So, premium generally contains risk portion plus savings portion. Savings portion is nothing but mere transaction and money, which is neither goods nor services, no GST. Now, if at all the premium contains only risk portion. Then what will happen? Assessable value is the entire premium. Assessable value is the entire premium. But if premium contains risk portion and savings portion, now it contains both. And the savings portion is intimated to the policy holder right in the beginning. That this is the savings portion and this is the risk portion. They will give you the slabs also. If you read the entire policy documents, they will be calculating the Slabs also. At times, you will be getting the breakup. This is a risk portion. This is a savings portion. In that case, insurance company will pay GST only on the risk portion. Entire premium less savings portion. Less savings portion. But there is one more possibility. The premium is containing risk and savings portion. But savings portion is not intimated to the policy yield. See, the first two scenarios are very simple. Premium contains only risk, entire premium. Premium contains risk plus savings and savings is clearly set to the policy holder. Then entire premium minus the savings portion which is again, which is again risk portion. Then what is interesting here? It is only when the premium contains both risk and savings portion but the savings portion is not intimated to the policy holder. The policy document does not specifically talk what is the exact amount of the Savings portion. In that case, if it is a single premium annuity policy, if it is a single premium annuity policy, one time premium you are going to pay, which is a very bigger amount, and thereafter you are not going to pay any premium. In that case, assessable value is equal to 10 percentage of the 10 percentage of the entire premium, which means they are trying to tell that risk portion is only 10 percentage. Why? The premium value will be very big, but the risk portion will be only 10 percentage. If it is a normal premium policy that you normally see in your day to day affairs, then for the first year, your risk portion is 25 percentage of the entire premium. If it is second year, third year, fourth year premium, then it is 12.5 percentage of the gross premium. If it is single premium monetary policy, risk portion is taken as 10 percentage. If it is yearly premium, first year risk portion is 25, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, the risk portion is 12.5 percentage. 12.5 Normally, a life insurance company will have all these together. So, you have to segregate them, then calculate it. For few policy holders, there will be only risk portion. That is the answer. For few policy holders, there will be risk plus savings and savings is intimated. 
remove savings portion this portion is answered for few policy holder that will be risk and savings but savings portion will not be intimated in that there will be few premiums that which will be single premium annuity policy for that portion 10 percentage other will be normal category in normal category few will be policy holders who have taken the policy for the first year it is 25 percentage and few policy holders will be paying premium for the second year third year it will be 12.5 percentage we'll have all these calculations now talking about the next part of the special valuation rule where the focus is on dealer of second hand goods dealer of second hand goods purchase and sale of second hand goods it cannot be applied for a company who is dealing with some other item and it is selling the motor vehicle you are not the dealer of second hand goods you are talking about dealer of sir, second hand goods if you are dealer of second hand goods you have two options you have two options one take the itc on that second hand goods and and pay gst on the normal selling price pay gst on the normal selling price so your assessable value will be equal to transaction value as per section 15 if you want itc on that second hand goods if you are not interested on itc on that second hand goods other itc you will get other itc will get but you will not get the itc of the second hand goods here you will get in the first scenario you will get itc of second hand goods also you will get other itc in the second case you will get itc of all other items but not itc of that item which you are dealing in second hand supposing i am dealer of motor vehicles second hand motor vehicles i will not get the itc of second hand motor vehicles all other itc of my expenses be it my audit fees advertisement expenses etc etc that itc i'll get that itc i will get i may have a premises which is taken on rent on which that gsc i'll get that itc i may have an auditor who's charging gsc i'll get that itc i may do advertisement on which gsc that i'll get that itc i may purchase other capital goods furniture etc i'll get itc i'll not get itc of what that second hand item Right, in that case, your assessable value is equal to selling price minus purchase price. Selling price minus purchase price, which is nothing but the margin. You call it as margin scheme. Profit. But here, you have to be very careful. All your provisions of valuation, till now, whatever we have discussed, right from section 15, right from 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 31, a 32. Please understand it is transaction value. It is different for each transaction. I may have transaction 1. I may have transaction 2. Transaction 1 selling price. Uh, uh, purchase price of second hand item is 1 lakh. And selling price is 1 lakh 20,000. Transaction 2 purchase price of second hand vehicle. Another vehicle is 1 lakh. But the selling price is say 70,000. Sold at loss. I cannot club both. I cannot club both. For the first case. Assessable value will be equal to. 10,000 profit margin. For the second case, assessable value will be equal to 0. The moment I get something in negative, it is 0. It is not minus 30,000. If I am selling at loss, it is not minus 30,000. It is 0. It is 0. That is called as margin scheme. That is called as I cannot club both. I cannot tell that, okay, net effect 0. No. I have to pay GSE on 10,000. Two disadvantages of margin scheme. First, I have to keep a track of the item. When it was purchased, what was the price? When it was sold, what is the price? That tracking is not required in normal case. But it is required in margin scheme. First disadvantage. Second, my margin will be disclosed to the customer. Because when I am going to raise an invoice, my selling price will be 1,10,000. But GST will be only on? GST will be only on 10,000. Say 10,000 multiplied by? 18 percentage. So, that 18 percentage on 10,000 will be 1,800. I am going to charge 1,11,800. This customer will think that price is 1 lakh. Price is 1 lakh 10,000. And rate is 18. So, he should have charged 18 percentage on 1,10,000. But he is charging only on 10,000. 
he may be happy at times so telling that okay okay by mistake he has charged on lesser amount happy he. and suddenly he may realize when he's having a discussion with his chartered accountant you may find that this 10000 is nothing but the margin and a sad story will be if at all the second hand dealer is his friend and he has said that there is no margin i'm selling for loss clearly your margin is disclosed to the customer your margin is disclosed to the customer because you are charging gsc on the margin because you are charging gsc on your margin. are you guys clear this understanding are you guys clear this understanding two disadvantages one to one linkage margin is disclosed one to one linkage margin is disclosed now there is a special point which is there in case of higher purchase and reposition how to find out the purchase value assume a company dk limited has purchased the goods has purchased the goods in april 2023 for 1 lakh plus gst it has given that item it has given that vehicle on higher purchase it has given that vehicle on higher purchase somewhere in say june 2023 on higher purchase installment higher purchase by the way it is supply of goods this person is not able to pay the installment after three installment he is not paying any installment therefore in september 2023 there is reposition of the reposition of the vehicle thereafter finally this dk limited who was initially the financier vendor for this high purchase transaction now he is reselling that goods that resale is happening supposing in the month of say december 2023 resale resale this resale is now happening for say 80000 rupees don't you think that dk limited becomes dealer in second hand goods yes when he has repossessed and reselling he is nothing but a second hand dealer he is nothing but a second hand dealer assuming that he wants to go under margin scheme in margin scheme selling price is 80000 selling price is it selling price minus purchase price selling price is clearly known 80000 what about purchase price can you take purchase price as 1 lakh no because he became the reseller of second hand goods only at the time of reposition and resale when he has purchased initially that was not a second hand item you cannot take that 1 lakh you cannot take that 1 lakh so what you have to do you have to take that 1 lakh as the base subtracted by 1 lakh multiplied by 5 percentage depreciation for every quarter now from which quarter to which quarter right from april first time inventory was originally purchased till december when it is being resold you may argue technically or logically that it should not be from april to december it should be technically from april to september because repurchase happened then. but they are telling the depreciation will do till the time the goods are sold so depreciation is from april when it was originally purchased till december when it is finally second time sold so what is that 5 percentage depreciation how many quarters are there from april 2023 till december 2023 how many quarters in gst quarters refer to calendar quarters even if it is june to december 23 it will be treated as three quarters even if this was june 23 to october 23 if i change this from june 23 to october 23 if at all i change this if i change the data and i make it from june 23 to october 23 even then it will be three quarters june will be treated as one quarter july to september second quarter 
October another quarter. So whether it is April to December or June to October, it will be treated as three quarters, calendar quarters. For entire GSC quarter means calendar quarters. So what will be the answer? How many quarters? Three quarters. So what is the selling price? Selling price was very clear, eighty thousand. What is that depreciated purchase price? One lakh subtracted by fifteen percent each. Eighty-five. So margin will be. Whenever you get an answer which is negative, your margin will be zero. Your margin will be zero. That is the answer. That for second-hand goods in case of repossession and resale. In case of repossession and resale. And the last scenario, if at all you are talking about vouchers are give, being given by companies to the employees or the customers for using those vouchers, the necessary value will be money value of the goods which are redeemable against such vouchers, which means which is nothing but the fair or fair value of the face value of the voucher. What you redeem is not allowed. The face value of the voucher will be treated as. Accessible value. The face value of the voucher will be treated as accessible value. Accessible value. We will be touching this again in your time of supply. Face value will be treated as accessible value. The last scenario, the last case is not allowed because nothing is notified. In your Rule Thirty Two Seven, it talks about certain notified services, but there are no notified services. That being the case, this is not allowed. So when you see a special valuation. How many cases are there in 31A? It is lottery, betting, gambling, including horse racing. 32. You have money changer. You have air travel agent. You have life insurance company. You have second hand goods dealer. Not only for motor vehicles, any second hand goods. Also, you have vouchers. You have vouchers. So these are all the cases where you apply special valuation. In the last part of this chapter, very simple part of this chapter is. Clarification, clarifications. Though it may look lengthy, it's only only clarifications. You're talking about your Rule 33, 34, and 35. These are only clarification. 33 tells that if at all you're pure agent, if at all you're pure agent, you need not pay GST on that value for which you're acting as pure agent. Supposing if I'm charging, if I'm charging one lakh. Plus, I'm charging ten thousand, where I'm collecting the ten thousand as pure agent. I'm collecting the ten thousand as pure agent. I'll be paying GST only on one lakh. It does not tells me what is the value. It tells this ten thousand will not be included. It tells this ten thousand will not be included. If I am acting as pure agent, it will not be included. If this clarification is not there. Your incidental expenses will come in picture, and it will tell that add this ten thousand also. This clarification is not that this incidental expenses will come in picture, and it will add this ten thousand also. To make sure that you are not covered by incidental expenses in addition, you have to have a pure agent concept, and pure agent concept, by the way, is a reverse of something that we have discussed in addition. It is payment by supplier to third party. On behalf of recipient, Ulta. In your addition, we discuss payment by recipient to third party on behalf of supplier. Add it. But payment by supplier to third party on behalf of recipient. If at all you are satisfying the criteria of your agent, it need not be. It need not be included in valuation. It need not be included in your valuation provision. That point need not be included in your valuation provision. So it is exactly ulta of one of the addition that you have discussed in your one of the addition that you have discussed in your valuation provision. Now first understand that it is to make sure that you are not hit by incidental expenses. Second understand what is the concept of pure agent. It is nothing but payment by supplier to third party on behalf of recipient on behalf of recipient. Right, you are collecting this as out-of-pocket expenses, reimbursement, out-of-pocket expenses, actual reimbursement, actual reimbursement. It's not any incidental charges. Actual reimbursement. I was not required to do something. 
I did it on behalf of recipient. Now I'm getting the reimbursement. I'm getting the reimbursement. I'm an indirect decorator. My charges were one lakh rupees. My customer said me that even purchase his electrical fittings. So I purchased his electrical fittings on behalf of the recipient. I had nothing to do with it. Now when I'm collecting the amount from my customer, I'll collect one lakh plus reimbursement for electrical fittings. But GST will be only on one lakh. Now what is meant by pure agent? What is meant by pure agent? Pure agent means you're talking about an agent. You're talking about an agent without profit margin. So pure agent you can bifurcate it as agent without profit margin. Agent without profit margin. This is agent. This is without profit margin. What is meant by agent? Supplier is acting as agent of the recipient. He is doing something on behalf of recipient. Agent means there is an agreement entered by supplier and recipient. And supplier is telling that, okay, I will do something on your behalf, but it is for finally your responsibility. So, if interior decorator is purchasing electrical fittings, it is on behalf of recipient. First condition is agreement. Second, whether the interior decorator will get the title to the electrical fittings? No. Interior decorator will not get the title to the electrical fittings. The ownership will be directly to the customer, recipient. Whether interior decorator will use this electrical fittings? No. Interior decorator will not use this electrical fittings. This will be used finally by the recipient. Whether interior decorator will have any margin on the electrical fittings? No. He will only collect the actual amount incurred by him. Rather, you will find that along with this invoice, the interior decorator has to give the invoice of the electrical shop. When I tell he is not getting the title, the electrical shop owner will write the name of the customer as interior decorator or the recipient of interior decorator. Recipient of interior decorator. Right. Agreement entered by the supplier with the recipient to act as agent. Supplier does not get the title. Supplier does not use the goods or services. Supplier does not have any profit margin on that 10,000 rupees which is actual reimbursement. This is the definition of pure agent. In addition to you being acting as pure agent, you have to make sure that you split up your pricing. You split up your invoice. 1 lakh is your charges, 10,000 is reimbursement. 10,000 is reimbursement. This is repetition. You, have to, you should be acting as pure agent. Secondly, you should go for split up pricing system. Thirdly, you make sure that the extra work that you are doing, that extra 10,000 you are charging is an additional work, not part of your work. It is an additional work, not part of your work. Purchasing electrical fittings was not part of your work. It is an additional work. Chartered accountant paying ROC fees, stamp duty at the time of incorporation is not part of the work. It is an additional work. But chartered accountant charging traveling charges and food charges in his invoice, audit fees plus travel and accommodation is part of your work. Which means if I have to do internal audit, I have to go there, travel, I have to stay there, accommodation, I have to have food, food charges. There I cannot act as pure agent because it is part of my work. It is my inward supply to do my outward work. It should be an extra work. It should be an extra work. Traveling charges, accommodation charges, that cannot be taken as pure agent. Why? So why traveling charges, accommodation charges, you are uh, segregating from that? Because for an auditor to do an internal audit, it is an inward supply. I have to travel, I have to go there, I have to stay there, I have to do, do the work. So it is not any extra work. Without going there, without saying that, I cannot complete the work. But if you take the other examples, I could have said no for electrical fittings, I could have said that directly make the payment. I could have said no for ROC fee stamp duty. I could have said client directly make the payment. But when you are talking about internal audit, for me to do that assignment, I need to travel there. I need to stay there. I need to have the food. That cannot be called as pure agent. That cannot be called as pure agent. One of the repeatedly asked questions by ICA is customs charges. Customs broker charging his fees. That will be included in his value. Customs broker will do a lot of extra thing. He will pay customs duty on behalf of importer. Pure agent. 
will pay transportation charges, dock fees, port fees on behalf of importer. Pure agent. He'll along with his invoice, he'll give traveling charges and accommodation charges. That is not pure agent. Customs broker will pay GSC on a service charges plus traveling charges and accommodation charges. They are all incidental expenses. That he cannot take the benefit of pure agent. He cannot take the benefit of pure agent. Are you guys clear with this understanding? That is the entire concept of your pure agent. Entire concept of your pure agent. That is one any very interesting circular with respect to pure agent. When you talk about your airline companies, airport authority of India and the customer. Airport authority of India needs to collect passenger service fees and user development fees from the customers. They tell that this passenger service fees is to make sure that they are giving services to the passengers. User development fees is to make sure that that airport improvises and there is a development. All nonsense. They are taking extra amount. They are taking extra amount. Who is collecting that extra amount? Airport Authority of India. But if you have ever travelled by airline, you don't have any contact with Airport Authority of India. <laughs> what they do? They tell airline companies to do it. They tell airline companies, when they are booking the tickets, collect our charges also. Collect our charges also. Passenger service fees and user development fees. Think and answer. What will be the value for Airport Authority of India? And what will be the value for airline company? Airline company. That is a customer there. This airline company will collect, will collect fair charges, travel taxes, so fair charges, 1 lakh rupees, travel taxes, 10,000 rupees. In addition to it, it will collect your passenger service fees plus user development fees, say 5,000. And finally, it will charge GST. Customer does not have any direct contact. No direct contact. Obviously, there is a supply provided by airport authority, but there is no direct contact. There is no direct contact. This entire amount will be paid to the airline company. What is the accessible value for the airline company? Accessible value for the airline company is 1,10,000. This 5,000, it is acting as your agent. What is the accessible value for airport authority of India? Accessible value for airport authority of India is, is 5,000. Right. The amount that 5,000, if at all anyone wants to take the credit, it's only the customer. If customer is giving his GSE details uh, by selecting business travel and giving his GSE details, he'll get the credit both of 1,10,000 plus GSE also of 5,000 plus GSE. He'll have two invoices. He may not directly get an invoice from Airport Authority of India, Airport Authority of India, but it may reflect in your GSCR to be. It may reflect in your GSCR to be. Are you clear with this understanding? What is the entire focus here? Airline company to the extent of five thousand rupees, it is acting as. It's like I have got nothing to do with this. I am collecting on behalf of someone else. So I have got nothing to do with this. That is the circular. Now. That is all about your rule 33, rule 34 and rule 35. Again, clarifications. 33 was a clarification. 34 and 35 is also clarification. What is rule 34 telling? If at all you get an amount which is a foreign currency, you have to convert that into Indian rupees. Yes or no? You have to convert that into Indian rupees. Now, what to do? When you are converting that into Indian rupees, first you have to find out time of supply. Step number one is time of supply. Step number two is exchange rate. Step number one is time of supply. First, select the date. First, go with the date. First date, then rate. First date, then rate. D comes before R. So, first date, then rate. First, find out the time of supply. Then, select the exchange rate. This will come only if at all the amount involved is foreign currency. Correct? The amount involved is Indian rupees. There is no use of rule 34. That is 1 lakh dollars. You have to convert that 1 lakh dollars into Indian rupees. So, first find out the, first find out the time of supply. 
first find out the when i tell first date it means first find out the time of supply for goods section 12 for services section 30 then find out the exchange rate and then find out the exchange rate for goods on that date go with cbic exchange rate not rbi rate exchange rate not fed i exchange rate go with cb exchange rate for services go with gap exchange rate depending on whether you have to go with uh, your uh, in days or is depends on what category of company you are so go with your go with your gap rates go with your gap rates generally accepted accounting principles it might be your in days it might be is it might neither of them for small categories it might be none of them you can apply as per your normal accounting principles or normal understanding that you have correct so when you start with your accounting you start with when in days is applicable when as is applicable at that times when selected as are applicable for smes there is only selected as not all as selected as are applicable so it depends that that being the case they have simplified it go with gap generally accepted accounting principles for goods go with cbac rate for services go with gap rate but for both first find out the date so first there will be multiple dates first freeze the date same time of supply on that date if it is goods only see cbic exchange rate don't see rbi don't see but i if it is service only see gap exchange rate that is rule 34 for you converting foreign currency into indian rupees and what is rule 35 come tax calculation if at all amount is including gst then how to find out uh, the value how to find out the tax? It is value multiplied by tax rate divided by 100 plus tax rate. How to find out the value? If at all I am required to find out the value, assessable value will be equal to value inclusive of inclusive of taxes multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus rate of tax. If at all the objective is to find out the value, numerator is 100. If the objective is to find out the tax, numerator is tax rate come tax calculation come tax this rate of tax is the correct rate of tax correct rate of tax if you thought it is five percentage finally if you find it is 18 in this formula you're going to take 18 percentage in this formula you're going to take 18 percentage right when you're going to calculate this formula if you've gone with wrong rate five percentage Finally, you find that it is 18. So, say 100 plus 5. But finally, you find it is 18. So, when you are trying to calculate this answer, you will go with 105. Though you have gone with wrong rate, you have collected something from the customer. Whether right or wrong, it is 105 final amount received from the customer. Multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus 18. This will give an answer. This is the final tax. If you take this number, what will, the, what will be the answer? 105 multiplied by 100 divided by 100 plus, 100 plus 18. It will be? Okay, I am going to take the tax. I need to find out the tax, final tax. So, I will take the numerator as 18. If I want to find out the tax, I will take the numerator as 18. Then, 16 point. So, rounding off to nearest rupee, 1, 16 rupees. What is the differential tax that you will end up paying? 16 rupees that you have to pay and already you have paid 5 rupees. Though it was wrong, already you have paid. So, what is the differential tax? So, final tax is 16. Differential tax is the correct tax minus the tax that is already paid. Right. What did I say in the question? In the question, I said, you collected, wrongly collected 5% GST. So, you collected... You collected 105. Finally, you found out the rate is 18. What to do now? Whatever you have collected, whether right or wrong, take that as the base. Multiplied by the rate of tax, if you want to find out the tax, divided by 100 plus the rate of tax. What rate of tax? Current rate of tax. You will get the final tax. This final tax is 16. But, out of the 16, you have already paid 5. Assuming that you have collected and paid to the government. So, differential tax that you have to pay now is 11. That you have to pay in hours, that is rule 35 for you. So, when you see all these points, you are done with your valuation provision. So, how we discuss the valuation provision? Basically, into four parts. One, 
normal valuation section 15 then valuation rules in three parts normal valuation rules 27 to 20 31 special valuation rules 31a 32 clarification 33 34 and 35 yes uh, now also to understand in your special valuation rules uh, of along with your uh, specified actionable claim which is for uh, betting gambling lottery and your uh, horse racing which is covered in rule 31a so there is uh, rule 31 way which talks about lottery separately and which talks about uh, betting gambling and horse racing so this is there in your rule 31a now you have rule 31 b and rule 31 c now your rule 31 b talks about valuation of your online money gaming online gaming including online money gaming and rule 31 d c talks about valuation for casinos in that aspect if you see your entire 31 a 31 b 31 c talks about valuation for your specified actionable claims which are subject to gst so now the focus is on rule 31 b and 31 c now in a netflix it is a very simple thing when you talk about rule 31 a as well as sorry 31 b as well as 31 c which is for uh, your online gaming including online money gaming 31 b and 31 c which is for casino so in a netflix it is the same please understand that uh, these rules are again for specific action claims and only for particular specific action claims og including omg 31b and 31c is for casinos and the net crux is more or less the same when you talk about your online gaming including online money gaming the value is amount paid or payable or deposited either it is paid or payable or deposited it might be by way of money or money's worth or even virtual digital assets so the amount which is paid or payable or deposited to the supplier which may be in form of money or money worth including virtual virtual digital assets which is uh, given by it now also understand that they have clarified in terms of proviso telling that when you are paying an amount uh, and it is highly possible that supposing uh, you are putting in dream 11 1 lakh rupees so 1 lakh rupees is the value paid or payable or deposited money money worth or virtual digital assets which is nothing but cryptocurrencies Secondly, they clarify that amount which is written back. Supposing I deposit 1 lakh in, say, Dream 11, online money gaming, and I use only 80,000 to balance 20,000 is returned or refunded. So they do clarify that the amount which is returned or refunded, returned or refunded will not be deducted because that amount has not been uh, used, will not be deductible. So why the amount is returned or refunded? Because you have not used that amount. The amount that you have paid or deposited, you have not used it. I have deposited 1 lakh in Dream 11, but I have played for only 80,000. So 20,000 rupees is written back. Value is 1 lakh. And the similar kind of understanding is there in Rule 31. See, there's one small change. Otherwise, it is a very similar kind of understanding. What is understanding? The basic understanding. Here again, they talk about amount paid or payable by the player. So there, when you talk about your OMG, OG including OMG, they are talking about paid, payable or deposited. And they talk about money, money worth of virtual digital assets. Here it is amount paid or payable. Deposited is not required, therefore removed. And money, money worth of virtual digital assets. Generally, it is not there in casino, so that is removed. But when you talk about amount paid or payable, it can be for two reasons. One, you are purchasing the tokens or chips for that amount. Secondly, you are not purchasing tokens and chips in casinos. Generally, when you go to casinos, you take tokens or chips. So, supposing I have taken the tokens or chips for... 1 lakh rupees 1 lakh rupees is the value again for tokens on chips they do clarify the same thing that they have said for omg if at all i have taken tokens and chips of 1 lakh rupees but i use only eighty thousand. so they have said that the amount returned or refunded by returning the tokens or chips will not be deductible will not be deductible same thing it is very similar to what we have seen in og including omg but here there is one more additional point is at times you may not pay the amount in form of tokens and chips you may pay an amount for participating in an event it may be a competition game or any scheme that amount where there is no tokens on chips where tokens and chips is not required in that particular case i have paid one lakh rupees for participating in an event i will not get any return or refund therefore our answer is one lakh see in entire scenario whether you talk about 31b or 31c whatever you have paid or payable or deposited will be taken as the value 
in any chance by any case if you are getting the return or refund because you have not used it which is highly possible in omg which is also possible in casinos but only for tokens and chips that returned amount or refunded amount will not be deductible then they give a more clarification which is for both 31b and 31c now what is the clarification which is for both 31b and 31c supposing i have paid or payable or deposited 1 lakh rupees in og including omg as well as in casinos say by way of tokens or chips now understand that i may win it so my 1 lakh gets converted to say 10 lakhs and out of the 10 lakhs i again play so my 1 lakh becomes 10 lakhs i get more token subsidies or i get more money or money in the words or virtual virtual digital assets more tokens and chips in case of casinos or more uh, money or money in words or virtual digital assets in case of uh, og including omg that extra 9 lakh rupees that i've got and i keep playing with that amount that will not be included in the value so for both 31b and 31c uh, the amount that is amount received by the player by winning an event whether it is game or competition or any scheme or any entity which is further used for playing will not be considered as paid or deposited which means that will not be included in value in a net crux whether it is og omg or whether it is casinos i uh, put money money worth virtual digital virtual digital assets uh, of 1 lakh in og including omg i take tokens or chips of uh, 1 lakh in casinos or i participate in an event uh, for 1 lakh in casinos that is the value if at all any amount is returned or refunded because i don't use it which is highly possible in og including omg which is possible in your casinos but only when it is by way of tokens or chips if i return that if i get the return or refund of 20000 rupees because because i did not use it that will not be deducted a value will still remain 1 lakh if that 1 lakh rupees becomes 10 lakhs because i have won a particular uh, online gaming including online money gaming or in casinos and i use that extra 9 lakhs again for playing it that 9 lakhs will not be included in value so that is out of the value so they talk about what is not to be deductible and what is not to be added so this portion will not be added so that's everything about you 31b and 31c now when you talk about section 93 rcm 93 rcm is for notified goods and notified services notified goods and notified services right where supply will not pay tax recipient will pay tax first we are focusing on notified goods section section 93 rcm on your notified goods notified goods so when you talk about section 93 rcm on your notified goods please focus here that we are talking about the list of notified goods first we will consolidate this list as first list where you are talking about cash units where you are talking about cash units not shield not or peeled bd wrapper leaves otherwise called as tendu tobacco leaves raw cotton what are the four items here cash units whether not it should not be shelled or peeled then bd wrapper leaves called as tendu tobacco leaves and raw cotton which is coming out of it raw cotton agricultural products raw cotton who should be the supplier supplier should be agriculturalist supplier should be Agric agriculture means only individual and HUF, not an agricultural company, only individual or HUF. The definition of agriculture includes only individual or HUF who is cultivating out of land. He is cultivating this out of land. Recipient, any GST registered person, who will pay GST? Recipient, registered person will pay GST. Agriculture is always out, kept outside GST. So, agriculture will not pay GST. Who will pay? registered recipient registered recipient will pay gst if the recipient is not registered no one will pay neither agriculturists will pay nor because agriculture is always kept safe always this is only true for agriculture when we see other points we will be understanding it because if it is not rcm by default it is fcm in normal case if it is not rcm by default it is which means if recipient is not paying it please supplier you pay it but not true in this case because we are talking about agriculturist we are talking about agriculturist right so what are the four cases of agriculturist cash units not shield not or peeled bd wrapper leaves tendu tobacco leaves and raw cotton supplier agriculturist he will not pay but recipient will pay but recipient should be gse registered person recipient you pay you pay by one hand take the credit in another pay by cash take in credit pay by cash take in 
R theme is inward supply or outward supply. For the recipient, it is inward supply or outward supply. Pay by cash treasure, get in credit ledger. If you are eligible for credit, get in credit ledger. That's the first category. Second category. You are talking about your second category. Second category is all of your uh, garment. One, you are talking about supply of lottery. Other, you are talking about used vehicles, seized and confiscated goods, old and used goods, waste and scrap. What are the list of items? Lottery, used, used vehicles, seized and confiscated goods, used and old goods and waste and scrap. Who is the supplier? Supplier is government. Supplier is? Sir, that is the difference. In the first point, government is only state government or union debt your local authority. Because lottery is always controlled by state. But in the second point, you will find, you will find even central government. That is the only difference. You know, buy at it. For lottery, central government do not have any role. Central government do not have any role. So, supplier is government. Supplier is government. Who is the recipient? For lottery tickets, recipient is lottery distributor or selling agent. Lottery distributor selling agent, you pay. You pay by cash, get in credit. You pay by cash, get in credit. You can use the credit. When he lottery distributor or selling agent is further selling it, he has to pay output tax. He can use the credit. He can use the credit. Right. So, in the first case, lottery ticket supplier is government, specifically state government, and recipient is lottery distributor or selling agent who will pay. Lottery distributor or selling agent. Government will never pay for on lotteries. They will shift the burden on the shift the burden on the lottery distributor or the selling agent. What about the second category? What is the second category? Used vehicles, seized and confiscated goods, old and used goods, and waste and scrap. Who's the supplier? Same government. Who's the recipient? Registered person. So if government is giving to registered person, then it is. Then it is RCM. If government is selling these items to unregistered person, FCM. If government is giving all these goods to registered person, then RCM. If government is selling all these goods to unregistered person, if normal people purchase all these items, then it is FCM. If it is not RCM by default, it is FCM. If it is not RCM by default, it is FCM. Clear? First four categories, agriculturist. Second, Two categories, government, government, then the balance categories, then the balance category. So, balance category will be this third category where even the last item will come. Balance category, balance category. In the balance category, other things will come. Say, for example, you are talking about priority sector lending certificate. Priority sector lending certificate. This priority sector lending certificate is given by one bank to another bank. One bank to another bank. If a one bank is not able to give a sufficient amount of loan to priority sector and other bank has given more loans to priority sector, that one bank will give a certificate to the other bank for a charge. Right? And it is all monitored by RBI. It is all monitored by RBI. So, priority sector lending certificate is given by one bank to Another bank, one bank to another bank. Whether supplier bank will pay GST or recipient bank will pay GST. Recipient bank will pay GST. Recipient bank will pay GST. So supplier bank will not pay GST. Recipient bank will pay GST. This is the only place where they have said supplier is also registered, recipient is also. Why? Very simple. All banks in India will be registered. All banks in India will be registered. So supplier. Bank, bank 1 is also registered, recipient bank, bank 2 will also be registered. So, we are shifting the liability on the, we are shifting the liability on the receiving bank. If you do not understand this, you will break your heads and try to run the supplier is also registered, recipient is also registered, then why shift the liability? Because you are talking about this, this certificate, priority sector lending certificate will be given by one bank to another bank and all banks in India will be so, shifting of liability will be the will be to the recipient bank. Will be to the recipient bank. Supplier is also registered. Recipient will always be registered. See, there are certain cases. 
where it will always 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 be rcm like this case it will be always rcm the last case will be always rcm most of the cases these are very rare cases most of the cases will be if at all condition is satisfied rcm if condition is not satisfied these are all very special cases if condition satisfied rcm if not satisfied fcm now other items other items are your silk yarn and your essential oils you need not buy at the list just remember essential oils not containing citrus fruit essential oils so silk yarn silk yarn who is the supplier supplier is manufacturer of silk yarn who is manufacturing from raw silk or raw si or silk worm cocoon for supply of silk yarn manufacturer of silk yarn manufacturer of silk yarn is the next item he is agriculture is not will not take silk yarn he will take raw silk so someone out of it will manufacture silk yarn so who is the supplier who is the supplier manufacturer of silk yarn it cannot be trader of silk yarn it should be manufacturer of silk yarn and who is the recipient so manufacturer of silk yarn to registered person i'll be giving two three questions answer it very clearly manufacturer of silk yarn to registered person louda manufacturer of silk yarn to unregistered person manufacturer of silk yarn to unregistered person trader of silk yarn to registered person trader of silk yarn to unregistered person only the first case is rcm manufacturer of silk yarn to to registered person rcm manufacturer of silk yarn to unregistered person fcm trader of silk yarn to registered person fcm trader of silk yarn to unregistered person fcm trader means fcm out of four cases only one case is under rcm so this is a speciality of rcm this is time and again proved in your service sector good sector you will not understand this much because it is all very simple when service sector you will understand that rcm is rarest of the rare case just by remembering the service will not help you you should know who is the supplier who is the cp essential oils essential oils not containing citrus fruit supplier supplier should be unregistered recipient recipient essential oil supplier unregistered recipient rcm fcm unregistered to registered unregistered to registered unregistered to registered registered to registered registered to registered registered to unregistered registered to unregistered conditions are important for essential oil supplier should be unregistered recipient should be registered only then rcm any other permutation combination registered to registered fcm supplier will pay registered to unregistered fcm supplier will pay so that is everything about your section 93 rcm for goods how many sectors are there actually you can make it very simple 4 3 2 4 when you talk about agriculture list Two when you talk about government, three others. Four, three, two. Four categories of agriculturalists, two categories of government, and three others. Private sector lending certificate, manufacture of silk yarn, and you are talking about essential oils. Four, three, and two. Four, three, and two. that is everything, everything about section. 9.3 RCM for notified goods. For notified goods. Now, when you talk about your section 9.3 RCM for notified services, let us try to evaluate your notified services. The first notified services, GTA services. Goods transportation agency services. Transportation of goods. Transportation of goods. Where 100% transportation of goods is by road. And the supplier gives a document called as consignment note. Consignment note. In normal language or local language, it is called as bill T. It is called as bill T. With bill, there is one more document. So, bill T. There will be an invoice along with consignment note. So, what is GTA? Transportation of goods is by road. 100% it is by road. And the supplier gives consignment note. Now, let us understand your 
services of GTA. Here we are trying to understand your exemption with RCM. Exemption with RCM in GTA sector. If at all, if at all you are transporting goods, the GTA is transporting goods for pure TDS detectors. For pure TDS detectors. What do you mean by pure TDS detectors? Who will detect TDS? Government or government agencies. And they have only GST TDS number. They don't have normal GSC number. They have only GST TDS registration number. They don't have normal GSC number. If transportation of goods by GTA is done for government having only GST TDS number, no normal GSC number, then it is exempt. Then it is exempt. This is the first category. Second category. If, if transportation of goods by GTA is done for if transportation of goods by GTA is done for individual or HUF, it is done for individual or HUF, which is which is not registered in GST, also not registered under Factories Act, then it is exempt. If GTA is transporting the goods for whom? Individual or HUF. Individual or HUF. Which is not registered in GST. And, and not registered under Factories Act. It is exempt. Rather than remembering all these complicated terms. That it should not be a factory or a society or a cooperative society or a partnership firm or a AOP. Or a... Registered person, you can make it simple. If you understand all these points, the summary of these all these points is it should be individual HUF. It should not be a partnership firm, it should not be a body corporate, it should not be a LLP, it should not be a society, it should not be a cooperative society. Rather than telling all these things, can I tell it should be individual HUF? Rather than telling that it should not be a partnership firm, not be a LLP, not be a society, not be a cooperative society, not be a body corporate, I can tell it should be. Individual achieve. Correct? Simple way. Simple way. Rather than telling that it should not be registered in GSC, uh, it, it should be not be registered in GSC, not be registered under Factories Act. Now, connect all the dots. It should be individual and HUF, not registered in GSC, not registered under Factories Act, exempt. It should be individual and H or HUF, which is not GSC registered person, which is not registered under Factories Act, then it is exempt. Then it is except. What if I am talking about a person, a normal person, which is not covered by your TDS detector, which is not covered by individual HF, not registered in GSC, not registered in factory set. For others, for others, it is generally taxable. But if the transportation by GT is of notified goods, first and second point, exemption is based on person. Exemption is based on person. This third category exemption is based on goods. In the first point, the exemption is based on person, government only having GSC TDS number. In the second point also the exemption is based on person, individual or HF not registered in GSC, not registered under Factories Act. This third point exemption is based on goods. The goods being transported are Namo RD. Namo RD. Right. So, you are talking about registered newspapers or magazines, agricultural produce, milk, salt, food grains, including flows, pulses and rice. Rice is not an agricultural produce. Paddy is. What about wheat? Wheat is already covered by agricultural produce. Wheat is already covered by Agricultural produce, registered newspapers and magazines, agricultural produce, M, milk, salt, sugar is not that, milk, salt, food grains including flows, pulses and rice, O is organic manure, Namo, RD, R is relief materials due to which is required at the time of natural disaster or man-made disaster, defense, 
D stands for defense or military equipments. See, first four items are very specific. What are the goods? Last two items, relief materials and defense materials, they don't tell what items. Whatever is required for relief materials and whatever is required for defense materials. Namo RD. Namo RD. If the goods transportation agency is transporting, Namo RD, it is exempt. Namo RD, it is if it is not covered by any of these categories. What is the any of these categories? Transportation of goods is not for government only having TDS number. Transportation of goods is not for individual HEF, not registered in GSC, not registered in Factories Act. Transportation of goods is not of Namo RD. Then it is taxable. Then it is. When it is taxable, if GTA wants FCM, then it will be FCM. If GTA wants FCM, then it will be FCM. GTA will collect and pay GSC. If GTA does not want FCM, by default it will be RCM. So by default, by default, by default it will be RCM. If GTA tells that no, no, I don't want RCM, I myself will collect and pay, then it will be FCM. So what is by default? RCM. If GTA tells, no, no, I want FCM, then it will be FCM. Right. So, that is the first category, GTA services. GTA services. So, here we have seen a part of exemption because without seeing exemption, it will not work. Why it will not work? If it is exempted, don't break your head to tell it is RCM or FCM. Only if it is not exempted, then you will evaluate RCM or FCM. Next, you are talking about legal services by advocate, legal services by advocate and legal services by arbitral tribunal. Legal services by, we are mixing both advocate and arbitral tribunal. So, both advocate and arbitral tribunal, few things are actually very, very common. If advocate or arbitral tribunal are providing services to non-business entity, Providing services to, supposing an advocate is providing services to a normal person for his family dispute, non-business entity, non-business entity or it is providing services to government or local authority or governmental authority or government entity, except non-business entity, except government, local authority, governmental authority, government entity, except or it is providing services to business entity, in India, but it is a small business entity, aggregate turnover in previous year is less than 40 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs. Mind you, now this time, aggregate turnover, we are taking of what? Previous year. Because we are not evaluating whether that business entity is registered or not. We are seeing whether the business entity is small or big. Who is the supplier? Advocate. Advocate is seeing whether that business entity is small or big. So, he cannot check the aggregate turnover of that recipient in current year. He will check that recipient's aggregate turnover in previous year. Aggregate turnover in previous year is less than 40 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 40 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs in previous year. If that is the case, it is exempt. If at all, it is providing services to business entity which is located in taxable territory and it is a big business entity, then it is taxable under RCM. It is taxable under RCM. And if at all it is providing services to foreign business entity, taxable under FCM. To make it more simple, to non-business entity, rather to government, governmental authority, governmental entity, government includes local authority. So, government, local authority, governmental authority, government entity, to non-business entity, to small business entity to big business entity, to foreign business entity. About whom are we talking? We are talking about both advocate services or arbitral tribunal services. Not tribunal. Tribunal is not at all supply. Arbitral tribunal, arbitrator, arbitrator. Services by court or tribunal is not at all supplied. We are talking about advocate and arbitrator. Advocate and Arbitrate out of the court settlement. Now, in this case, here no GSE, here no GSE, here no GSE, here GSE under 
RCM here, GST under CM. Are you guys clear with this understanding? Are you guys clear with this understanding? So, if answer is same for advocate and arbitral tribunal, why it is given separately? Because in advocate, there is one special category. Arbitral tribunal, arbitral tribunal, arbitrator only this much. Over. In advocate, there is one special category. What is that special category? One advocate to another advocate. One advocate to another advocate. The service is given by one advocate to another advocate, then things are different. Advocate to advocate. One advocate can give services to another advocate. Then obviously things actually are different. Things actually are different. If advocate is giving services to another advocate. If advocate is giving services to another advocate. Then how to categorize it? How to categorize it? Now categorize in this way. If at all, it is representation services for business entity in taxable territory. Representation services, business entity in taxable territory. Others. If it is representation services in to a business entity in taxable territory, which means understand that one advocate will provide services to another advocate and that another advocate is giving services to Reliance Limited. So, that is advocate 1, advocate 2 and Reliance Limited. The focus is on one advocate to another advocate. If it is representation services to a business entity in taxable territory, then you don't take it as two contracts. Actually, how many contracts are there? Two contracts. But if at all you are talking about representation services, representation services to business entity which is in taxable territory, which means you are talking about the far last person is a business entity that is Reliance Limited in taxable territory in India, then you will take this contract as advocate 1 to Reliance Limited. You will make the two contracts into, you will make the two contracts, RB, you will make artificially two contracts into one contract. You will ignore advocate two. You will ignore advocate two. In that case, in that case, if, if this Reliance Limited, I am writing this Reliance Limited because that is a business entity in taxable debt. If Reliance Limited is small business entity, if Reliance Limited is big business entity. If Reliance Limited is small business entity, exempt. If it is big business entity, taxable under special RCM. Taxable under, why I am writing it as special RCM. Who will pay? Reliance Limited will pay. Technically, for Advocate 1, Reliance Limited is not the recipient. In reality, for Advocate 1, who is the recipient? But now, artificially, you are making... Reliance Limited as the recipient. Reliance Limited as the recipient. Are you guys clear with this understanding? Are we guys clear with this understanding? When I tell other services, it will include two categories. Representation services to non-business entity or representation services to business entity but in non-taxable territory or advisory services. It will include all these three categories. Representation services to non-business entity or to business entity in non-taxable entity or the service itself is the service itself is advisory services. It is not representation service. Representation service means that advocate has to go in front of an authority and present the case. Advisory service means advocate can sit in the office and give opinion, give an advice. Do this, do that and get a piece. Right. So, advisory services. In this case, in this case, you are going to bifurcate the scenario into two parts. Into two parts. First part. First part. Senior advocate. Senior advocate to 
another advocate senior advocate to another advocate second part other than senior advocate which means you cannot call it as junior advocate but other than senior advocate or firm of advocates to another advocate here you are talking about advocate one and advocate two advocate one and advocate two if the supplier is senior advocate and recipient is another advocate then you have to ask whether that another advocate is small business entity or another advocate is big business entity if that another advocate is small business entity exempt small means exempt previous year aggregate turnover is up to 40 lakhs 20 lakhs and lakhs small always means what previous year aggregate turnover, not current year previous year aggregate turnover up to 40 2010 now you are not trying to find out your registration you are trying to find out whether your recipient is small or big so you will not take Current year aggregate turnover because you cannot find out in current year. You will take previous year aggregate turnover. If another advocate is big advocate, then it is under RCM. Another advocate will pay. Another advocate will pay. If it is by other than senior advocate or firm of advocates to another advocate, it is always exempt. It is always exempt. This ICA is never ever touched. But obviously, you have all these points. It has never ever touched. How to bifurcate it? Advocate to another advocate. Representation services to business entity in taxable territory. You will not see advocate 1 to advocate 2, advocate 2 to Reliance Limited. You will merge it as one. Advocate 1 to artificially bring it as one contract. Remove advocate 2. In that case, if the recipient reliance limited is small, exempt if the recipient reliance limited is big, RCM, taxable under RCM. Special RCM because technically reliance limited is never the recipient, but artificially it is the recipient. Other services, other services means what? Representation services to non-business entity or to business entity outside India or advisory services. Here you have to ask who is that advocate? Supplier advocate is senior advocate. Supplier advocate is other than senior advocate or form of advocates. See, if the supplier advocate is other than senior advocate or form of advocates, or form of advocates answer is very simple. Exempt. Answer is very simple. Exempt. If the supplier advocate is senior advocate, then you have to ask whether the recipient advocate is small. Exempt. Recipient advocate is big. Taxable under RCM. Taxable under RCM. Clear? That is for advocate to advocate. You don't have this complication when you talk about arbitral tribunal. You have to remember in two ways. Advocate to client. This was all about advocate to advocate to client. This was everything all about advocate to your client. Or arbitral tribunal to client and this was everything about advocate to advocate this was everything about advocate to advocate are you guys clear with this entire understanding that is everything about your advocates and arbitral tribunal advocates and arbitral tribunal next you are talking about fourth category sponsorship services sponsorship services now understand when you talk about sponsorship services, when you talk about the fourth category, sponsorship services, sponsorship services exempt only for one category. Sponsorship services exempt only and only for one category. If sponsorship is of sports event plus organized by notified bodies. I repeat. Sponsorship of sports event organized by notified body. Organized by only and only then it is exempt. Any other sponsorship service. What is meant by any other sponsorship service? Sponsorship may be of sports event but organized by other than notified body. Or sponsorship is of 
any other event it can be an educational event it can be an entertainment event it can be a scientific scientific event it can be a conference it can be a celebration it can be a fair correct when sponsorship services exempt two criteria sponsorship should be of sports event and that too organized by only then it is exempt if it is any other sponsorship service any other sponsorship what do you mean by any other sponsorship service it can be sponsorship of a sports event but not organized by it is not organized by notified it is not organized by notified body or it can be sponsorship of any other event not be, it not be sports event it can be any other event rather i can write in this way it can be sponsorship of a event not being a sports event not being a educational event entertainment event scientific event award functions conference celebration fair anything else music event anything else it is taxable when it is taxable as the first we'll see when it is actually exempt sports event notified body you may ask what are who are the notified bodies there are five notified bodies don't try to by heart just be familiar who are the notified bodies the notified bodies should be national sports federation or its affiliated federation where the participating team or individuals either represent their country or zone or state or even district so it does not even only covers bcci it also covers tncb it also covers tamil nadu cricket board where the where the team or player represents the state represents the state second association of indian Univers universities or inter university sports board or school games federation of india or all india sports council for deaf paralympic committee of india or special olympics bharat special olympics bharat or that notified body is central civil services cultural and sports board when you're talking about civil services they'll have a cultural and sports board or you're talking about the notified body being a part of national games by indian olympic association indian olympic association see there's a difference special olympics bharat is for specially challenged persons now it is normal specially challenged people so it is indian olympic association and lastly you're talking about that sporting event being organized by notified body under panchayat yuva krida or khel abhiyan in if at all i want to translate it village i mean youth village youth promotion of sports panchayat is village you as youth krida and khel activities and sports abhiyan means program abhiyan means program right so that is these notified bodies don't try to buy at them be familiar be if sponsorship for, is for a sports event organized by these by notified bodies then it is exempt otherwise it is always taxable and by the way when it is taxable be very clear that it is under rcm a supplier can be any person supplier can be if the recipient if the recipient is body corporate firm or llp in india it is rcm who should be the supplier anyone who should be the recipient partnership firm llp body corporate in india rcm any other category fcm any other category fcm ipl organized by tata limited rcm or fcm sorry ipl sponsored by tata limited rcm or fcm ipl tata limited ipl tata limited ipl tata limited ipl tata limited now first tell me who is the supplier who is the recipient who is the supplier who is the recipient in ipl and tata limited because in sponsorship service students make a mistake of finding out who is the supplier who is the recipient tata limited is the 
No. It is going to make the payment. So it is the recipient. Organizers of IPL are supplier. Tata Limited is the Tata Limited is the the person who is making the payment is the so first don't make a mistake. This is a very common mistake made in sponsorship service. So Tata Limited is the recipient. Whether recipient is body corporate, yes, RCM. So this. Sponsorship by Tata Limited for IPL is covered under RCM. What if I change the entire situation? I sponsored an event organized by ITC Limited. Vishal Jain sponsored an event organized by ITC Limited. Who is the supplier? Who is the recipient? Be very careful. Recipient is? I am the recipient. Vishal Jain is the recipient. Vishal Jain is the recipient and who is the supplier? ITC Limited because I sponsored an event which means I have given the amount and my name will be there at the event everywhere. So who is the supplier? ITC. Supplier can be anyone. Who is the recipient? VJ. Now understand that it is not RCM because recipient is neither. Supplier who is he not relevant? ITC Limited is only given to confuse you. Supplier can be anyone. So, ITC Limited is not relevant. Recipient. Is it partnership firm? No. LLP? No. Body corporate? No. FCMRCM. So, who is the supplier? ITC Limited. It will pay under FCM. It will collect from me and pay. It will collect from me and pay. So, be very careful. Be very careful. One example of IPL, Tata Limited. One example of VJ and ITC Limited. Be very careful. Who is paying the amount? See, what is the service that I am getting? By paying the amount to ITC Limited. Everywhere is advertised. Sponsorship is one of the type of advertisement. Everywhere in the event organized by ITC Limited. Say it might be an event for their employees. My name will be there. <laughs> Everywhere in the event of IPL, Tata Limited name is there. Correct? The person who sponsors it or makes the payment is the recipient. <laughs> who should be the supplier? Anyone. Supplier, whether he is body corporate or not, not relevant. But who should be the recipient? Partnership firm, body, uh, LLP or body corporate. Supplier, body corporate, recipient, body corporate. FCM, RCM. FCM, RCM. Sponsorship, so supplier, body corporate, recipient, body corporate. FCM, RCM. Supplier, body corporate, recipient, partnership firm. Uh, even if it is partnership firm, it is a supplier, maybe body corporate. But recipient is, you don't look at, oh, body corporate, bigger partnership firms want to know. Recipient, supplier can be anyone. Recipient, is it partnership firm, LLP, body corporate? Yes. It is under RCM. It is under RCM. Now, the lengthiest services of your entire exemption in RCM is government service. The lengthiest service. It is the lengthiest service in your entire RCM and exemption. Both when you see exemption as well as RCM, it is the lengthiest services. Now, let us try to see that. Services by government. Services by? So, government or local authority is the supplier. If services by government, PML and PPT others. PML PPT others. Panchayat related services article article 243 it is not at all supply. Municipality related services article, panchayat related services article 243G, not supply. Forget about exempt or taxable, it is not at all supply. Municipality related services article 243W, not at all supply. Forget about exempt or taxable, it is not at all supply. Liquor license fees, no, it is not at all. So, there is no question of exempt supply or Taxable supply, it is not at all supply. PML, this you have discussed in your discuss supply. It is not at all supply. PPT, you are talking about postal services, port services, port transport, I mean uh, port airport services and transport services. When you talk about PPT, when you talk about your PPT, you have to bifurcate it. You have to bifurcate it. 
your port airport related services port airport related services is always taxable under fcm is always taxable under fcm when you talk about your postal services postal services post card inland letter book post ordinary post where it is less than 10 grams where it is less than so here better make a change and and make write that you are talking about up to 9 grams is the wrong way write less than 10 grams because less than 10 grams can be 9.9 .9 grams it is not 10 grams less than 10 grams can be 9 point so up to 10 grams i am not writing less than or equal to 10 grams up to 10 grams others port airport related services all category transport services it is exempt category others exempt category others now postal services if it is postcard inland letter book post ordinary post less than 10 grams exempt if it is other postal services if it is other postal services any other postal services then it is taxable and by the way they don't only talk about postal services they also talk about railway services ministry of railways ministry of railways post and railway it is taxable under fcm taxable under fcm now port airport related services lot of government i mean government is involved in port and airport so any port airport related services to anyone to anyone always taxable fcm transport services transportation sector has an exemption if it is exempt for private sector it is exempt for government if it is exempt for private sector it is even exempt for government if it is taxable for private sector if it is taxable for private sector it is taxable even for government and whenever these are taxable it is all under fcm so when you talk about first category is what post and railways post and railways. in post one there is exemption pbo less than 10 grams exempt any other service taxable taxable fcm port airport related always taxable fcm transportation if it is exempt for private sector exempt for government if it is taxable for private sector taxable for government and when it is taxable again fcm in all these three cases whenever it is taxable you find a very important point that it is under fcm i see it does touches this if they are talking about postal services where it is taxable fcm railway services where it is taxable fcm if it is talking about port airport services where it is taxable fcm if it is talking about transport services wherever it is taxable it is fcm no rcm no rcm now when you talk about the leftover categories when you talk about the leftover categories here you have to open a new chart others now who is the supplier government or local category what is the service any other services other than PML other than PPT correct other than PML other than PPT other than PML other than PPT if it is if it is given by government or local authority to another government or local authority government or local authority to another government or local authority or even governmental authority governmental entity government to government government to government exempt government to government exempt government to others government to others wait that others if others is non business entity others is non business entity normal public then it is then it is exempt 
But if it is business entity, no, wait. If that business entity is small business entity, previous year aggregate turnover is previous year aggregate turnover is previous year, not current year. You are not looking at your turnover, you are looking at your customer's turnover. Previous year aggregate turnover is up to 40, 20 or 10 lakhs. Whether registered or not, forget about it. It is a small business entity. In this chapter, you have to be very clear. Your recipient may be registered or not, but it is a small business entity means, it is a small business entity means, exempt. If it is a big business entity, no, wait. If the amount is small amount, up to 5,000, exempt. If the amount is small amount, it is exempt. If the amount is big amount, no, wait. If, if, it is a notified activity. So, there is a list of exemption. If it is notified activity, apart from this, exempt. If it is other than notified activity, now you can tell it is taxable. See the list. So, if it is government to government, exempt. Government to others, wait. Government to non-business entity, exempt. Government to business entity, wait. Government to small business entity, exempt. Government to big business entity, wait. Government to big business entity, value less than or equal to 5000, exempt. More than 5000, wait. Notified activity, exempt. Other than notified activity, taxable, but wait. Now, it is clearly taxable whether it is FCM or RCM. For FCM or RCM, ask two questions. Whether it is renting of immovable property services, or whether it is other services. If it is renting of immobile property services, if it is renting of immobile property services, if the recipient is registered, recipient is not registered. Other services, recipient is in taxable territory, recipient is in non-taxable territory. Now tell me FCMRC. Renting of immobile property services, government is a supplier, recipient is, government is supplier, recipient is registered. It is clearly taxable. If recipient is registered, RCM, he will pay. If he is not registered, CM. Other services, if recipient is in India, RCM will pay. If recipient is outside India, CM. Don't worry, the same thing is given, exactly the same thing is given us in this way. Same thing. I have presented by way of chat, the same thing is given in this table. This is the list of notified activities which I am not going to take, you can walk through yourself. In this entire story, there was a notified activity, correct? These are the 8 or 9 points of notified activities which are exempt. But the problem with why ICA loves government services I believe now you will understand because there is so much thrill and fun. PML separate, PPT separate, others separate. And in PPT, PML never GST. PPT, there may be GST. If it is that, it is always FCM. If it is that, it is always others. There are a lot of exemptions. There are a lot of exemptions. Government to government, exempt. Non-business entity, exempt. Small business entity, exempt. Up to 5000, exempt. Notified activity is exempt. If it is crossing all these things, then it is taxable. And when it is taxable, FCM, RCM depends. Renting of immobile property. Recipient registered, RCM. Recipient not registered, FCM. Other services. Now registered, not registered is not important. Recipient in India, RCM. If he is not registered, compulsory registration, section 24. If he is not registered, compulsory registration, section 24. Recipient outside India. FCM. So, here when it is taxable, it can be RCM or FCM. RCM or FCM. Two important aspects here. This exemption for small business entity is not applicable for renting of immobile property services. What is the meaning of this? When you are evaluating this entire chart, if it is renting of immobile property, you do not see this small business entity, big business entity. You see everything else. Government to government, except. 
government to non business entity exempt but don't see small business entity value less than or equal to 5000 exempt for renting of immobile property you will not evaluate whether the receipt is small or big whether it is small or big it is taxable there is no differentiation there is no differentiation second second when you talk about this 5000 normally this 5000 is per contract but this 5000 is per financial year if it is continuous supply of services which means if it is repeatedly coming again and again again and again so 5000 is not per invoice it is for the entire financial year normally 5000 is for invoice but if that service is given by government again and again repeatedly every monthly basis you will get invoice or every quarterly basis you will get invoice then this 5000 is not per invoice this 5000 is for entire financial year exemption still will be there but 5000 will not be per contract or per invoice it will be for entire financial year continuous supply of services clear application is important chart is okay when you see questions you will make mistakes for sure if at all you have not worked out earlier you will make mistakes because it has to get settled down but whenever you make mistakes when you come back to chart you will know where mistake what mistake you exactly made you have to be very clear with this understanding very very clear with this the lengthiest exemption and the lengthiest rcm is government service and if you are very comfortable with government service with respect to exemption and rcm you are very you have found exemption very simple you have found rcm is simple because this involves great depth and if you don't have a proper sequence your mind works like a computer system multiple tabs will get open you don't know which one to select first bet you don't know which one to now if your multiple tabs are open, you know properly which sequence to come. So, you will not make mistakes. You know which system, which tab should be checked first, which tab should be checked next. So, you will come step by step and you will not make a mistake. Are you guys clear with this understanding? ICA test has touched this area a lot of times. And a very simple way to crack this correct answer is this chart. Properly go with this particular sequence. Keep in mind this chart and evaluate it. Think carefully, PML separately, PPT separately, other separately. Be it very clear. PML, no GSC, never. PPT, there may be GSC, always FCM. Others, there may be GSC, it may be FCM, it may be RCM. But there are a lot of exemptions. In others, there are a lot of exemptions. That is everything about your services by, services by government. Now, when you talk about directorial services, this we have touched already when we have seen your supply. Director services. Now, if the director is managing director, whole time director, he will get remuneration. And even the company will deduct TDS under section 192, employer-employee relationship. Supply or no supply? Supply or no supply? It is not at all supply, no GST. Other directors, other directors, where they are not going to get remuneration, they are going to get Professional fees where the TDS will also be under 194J. Supply or not supply? Supply. GSE will be there? Yes. Under RCM. If any director is giving any other service other than director service, say for example, renting of immobile property, then they are not acting like directors. It will be taxable under FCM. Taxable under FCM. Insurance agent services. Who is the supplier? Insurance agent. Who is the recipient? Insurance company. Always under RCM. Always under supplier, insurance agent. Recipient. Recipient, insurance company. Always under RCM. If at all you talk about PasaBazaar.com. PaisaBazaar.com. Now, RCM or FCM? It depends. If PaisaBazaar.com has got an insurance agent license under Section 42 of Insurance Act, then it is insurance agent. Then it is RCM insurance company will pay. If PaisaBazaar.com, it is working like insurance agent, but it is not having insurance agent license. Then technically it is not 
insurance agent. It may be agent roughly, but technically it is not insurance. FCM, RCM. FCM. It will be FCM. Now, you are talking about permitting the use or enjoyment of copyrights. Temporary transfer or permitting the use or enjoyment of copyright services. Simple language, copyright services. If copyright services are given for original, dramatical work, musical work, artistic work. Original, dramatical work, musical work, artistic work. Who is the supplier? Music composer, photographer or the artist or the and who will be the recipient? Music company or the producer? Who will pay GSC? Music company or the producer? Recipient will pay GSC. But wait. Understand this. A.R. Rahman is composing song for Sony Music. A.R. Rahman for Sony Music. RCM. Original musical work. Original musical work. Supplier is music composer A.R. Rahman. Recipient is music company RCM. Sony Music is giving the copyrights of that song to Geo Savan app, Spotify app, etc. etc. Why? It's not original music. It is further copyright. It is FCM. It is FCM. Understanding the difference? That is the relevance of the term original. Now, there is one more copyright service, original literature work, literary works, books, original literary works. Who is the supplier? Author, book writer, author. Who is the recipient? Publisher. Who will pay GSC? Normally publisher. But if author wants, he can go for FCM. And what is the condition? Author should make sure that he is registered and he is giving a declaration to his commissioner that he is interested in. That is interested in FCM and he should not withdraw that for one year. If he is telling that he should be under FCM, minimum he should be there one year under FCM. And all on his all invoices, he should mention the fact that it is FCM in simple language. By default, author to publisher is RCM. But if author wants, he can make it FCM. Now, this option is there only in two cases throughout GSC law, GTA and author. GTA and by default GTA service when taxable is RCM, author service given to publisher is taxable under RCM. But if they want, they can go for FCM. They can go for this option is not given to anyone else other than GTA and author. Next, banking sector. Banking sector. Recovery agent services. Supplier is recovery agent. Recipient is banking sector, FCM, RCM. Lauda, recovery agent to Reliance Limited, FCM. Recovery agent to bank, RCM. Recovery agent to Reliance Limited, FCM. Direct selling agent, you will get calls, right? Do you want credit card or loan and all? Direct selling agents. Direct selling agent to banks, no. If the direct selling agent is individual, then it is, then it is RCM. If the direct selling agent itself is a company or a partnership or more LLP. See now the supplier, supplier, you normally you see recipient for FCM RCM. At times you will see supplier for FCM RCM. At times you will see both. Now you are looking at supplier. If DSA is individual, RCM. If he is not individual, FCM. Now, you are talking about member of overseeing committee to RBI. The special committee is there by RBI. Members of overseeing committee. Professions will be there. Supplier are professions. Members of overseeing committee. Who is the recipient? RBI. FCM, RCM. RCM. RBI will pay. Who are the suppliers? Members who are sitting in that overseeing committee. If it is members of any other committee, Members of any other committee to RBI. Members of overseeing committee to RBI. Members of any other committee to RBI. FCM. It will be FCM. Now, business facilitator or business correspondent. Business facilitator or business 
Now you have to understand this with exemption first. If at all you are talking about business correspondent or business facilitator, business correspondent is a bigger person, business facilitator is a smaller person. If they are providing, if they are providing services to a banking company in rural area or an insurance company in rural area, it is, it is exempt. It is exempt. And if they are taking the help of third party agents, see normally they will go to villages and provide services to banking company in rural area, insurance company in rural area. They cannot directly knock the doors of the villages. They will take the help of agents there. But look at the INE. Business correspondent, business facilitator to banking company in rural area, exempt. Agent to business correspondent, business facilitator, exempt. Business correspondent to or business facilitator to insurance company in rural area, rural area, exempt. But agent to business correspondent, business facilitator in relation to insurance company in rural area, unfortunately, it is not exempt, it is taxable. If BCBF are giving services to banking company or insurance company in rural area, their services is always exempt. But if they are taking the help of agents, if it is in relation to banking company in rural area, it is exempt. If it is in relation to insurance company in rural area, it is taxable. This is the main contract. Main for banking sector, both main contract is exempt, subcontract is exempt. For insurance sector, main contract is exempt, but subcontract is taxable. If I change this, then everything is, everything is taxable. If I remove this rural area, then everything is taxable. Clear? This is all about exemption. Now talk about FCMRCM. How to understand FCMRCM? Now, please, when you are understanding FCMRCM, you have to ensure that you write it separately for business correspondent and business facilitator. Business correspondent and business facilitator. Banking company, banking company. Insurance company, insurance company. That is agent, agent. And we are talking about FCM, RCM only if it is, only if it is taxable, right? If it is exempt, you will never discuss about you will never discuss about FCM or RCM. So, understanding that it is taxable, second step, FCM or RCM. Business correspondent always is a big person and business facilitator has got a lesser responsibility, smaller person. He has got a lesser responsibility, smaller person. Agent to business correspondent. Business correspondent is a big person. He will pay under RCM, pay by cash, getting credit ledger. Business correspondent to Banking company, he is himself is a big person, he will pay under FCM, he will pay output tax under FCM, he will use the credit. Same way, agent to business correspondent, he is a big person, he will pay under RCM. Business correspondent to insurance company, he is a big person, he will pay under RCM. So, when he is paying under RCM, he will pay by cash, get in credit ledger. When he is paying under FCM, he will use the credit. When he is paying output tax under FCM, he will use the credit. But when you talk about business facilitator, he is a, he's a small person. He is a small person. Agent to business facilitator. Can business facilitator help? No. It will be under FCM. Business facilitator to banking company. So he wants help. Banking company will help RCM. See, whenever I am talking about FCM, Please understand that if agent is having the threshold limit of 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs, he can enjoy that limit. So don't confuse it. If he is having the limit of 20 lakhs, 10 lakhs or 40 lakhs, he can use the limit not to pay tax. RCM, no option, compulsory registration. But FCM, you can still enjoy the limit of 40, 20 and 10 lakhs. You can enjoy that limit of registration. But if you have crossed it, it will be FCM. It will be FCM. Agent to business facilitator for insurance sector. 
whether business facilitator is small person or big person whether it will help agent or he last agent to help himself help himself fcm business facilitator to insurance company it should have been rcm but unfortunately it is fcm see it is just like this when you talk about when you talk about your when you talk about your insurance sector there are two illogical points if at all first talk about the exemption main contract is exempt if insurance company in rural area but subcontract is but subcontract is so this is illogical likewise if at all you are talking about business facilitator as small person if business facilitator is giving services to banking company it is a rcm logical but when it is giving to insurance company illogical it should have been rcm but it is fcm but it is cm so this is all about your exemption and rcm for banking sector now security services when you talk about security services there is no exemption there is no there is no exemption absolutely there is no exemption security services supplier should be other than body corporate recipient should be no that is for renting of motor vehicles for passengers recipient should be a supplier should be other than body corporate recipient can be body corporate or non body corporate but it should be wait this is rcm but wait registered person means what he should be a registered person not being registered only for the purposes of tds not being registered only for the purpose of pure tds registration government sector government sector not being registered under composition scheme so we are not able to understand what it is if at all i tell supplier is a body corporate recipient can be anyone it is always under fcm it is always under fcm because supplier it's a body corporate if supplier is a non body corporate recipient is unregistered person fcm registered person but registered under composition scheme fcm registered person but registered only for gsc tds not having normal gsc number government sector fcm registered person registered under regular scheme having normal gsc number rcm so this first case second case third case is all under is all under fcm whenever i write fcm it will be written near supplier because he has to pay and whenever i write rcm it should be near written near recipient actually out of these eight cases in the first category four cases in the second category four cases in the first category recipient could have been the same recipients but if the supplier is a body corporate by default it is fcm for it to be rcm supplier should be other than body corporate recipient should be registered under regular scheme having normal gsc number not gsc tds number it should have normal gsc number then it is in any other case in any other case fcm supplier other than body corporate recipient registered regular scheme normal gsc number only 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 if everything is satisfied it is rcm any other case this any other case will include all the four cases of the first scenario and the first three situations of the second scenario it will be all fcm it will be all fcm i said you the only area throughout gsc where you have to buy art is all rcm just remembering security services will never help you will never ever help you now 
when you are talking about other services, where you are talking about, say, renting of immediately after security services, I will try to take the related services, renting of motor vehicle designed to carry passengers, where the cost of the fuel is included in the consideration. Normally, when renting of motor vehicle is there for passenger, cost of the fuel is by default included, still a clarification is there. Cost of the fuel should be included in consideration. Who should be the supplier? Supplier should be other than body corporate plus not charging GST at 12 percentage. Two conditions. Other than body corporate, not charging GST at 12 percentage. Recipient should be body corporate in taxable limit. Recipient should not be registered. It should be body corporate. If it is not registered, compulsory registration. Compulsory registration if it is under RCM. Now, for this was everything whatever we have discussed was for what services? It was all for security services, correct? This example entirely was for security, security services. Now, if I take this for renting of motor vehicles designed to carry passengers where the cost of the fuel is included. If I tell supplier is a body corporate, multiple scenarios, what will be answer? Always FCM. Supplier is not a body corporate but charging GST at 12 percentage. Any scenario, it will always be FCM. Supplier is not a body corporate and it is not charging 12 percentage on its invoice. Then, then Recipient, if it is body corporate, if it is body corporate or recipient is, recipient is also non-body corporate other than body corporate and recipient is body corporate. If supplier is non-body corporate, recipient is also non-body corporate, it is, if supplier is non-body corporate, not charging 12 percentage and recipient is a body corporate in India. See, for RCM to be there, one thing is common. Recipient should be in. So, that by default is for all the RCM services. I have not specifically highlighted. It is for all the RCM services. Now, it is only now it is RCM. Only and only now it is only when supplier is not body corporate, not charging 12 percentage. Recipient is body corporate in taxability. Only, only then it is any other permutation combination, any other permutation combination, it was, it was FCM. I want to make to understand RCM is very exceptional. Normally, it would have been all under FCM. It is very exceptional case here. Clear? Clear? Keep this in mind. If not covered by RCM, if it, is, it is FCM. If not covered by RCM, it is FCM. Next, security lending scheme you already discussed. Security lending scheme, IGST Act, security lending scheme. Supplier is the lender who is giving the securities on lending through stock exchange. On lending through stock exchange. Recipient is the borrower. Supplier is the long term investor who does not want his securities for the time being. He is lending into the Recipient borrower who is interested in short term trading. The advantage of for the lender is getting passive income. Getting passive income, lending charges. The advantage is for the borrowers without purchasing the shares. Just by lending that amount, you are doing short term trading. And it is all happening through stock exchange. Regulated by SEBI. Regulated by now. It is covered under RCM. This is the only case where it is always RCM. Where it is always, there is no question of FCM. And this always RCM will, this RCM will always be, this RCM will always be, this why? The supplier and recipient, lender and borrower will never know each other. For finding out CGSC, SGSC or IGSC, you should know location of supplier and place of supply. Who will pay GSC here? Borrower. Whether borrower knows the lender? No. When supplier is not known, can you find out location of supplier? No. 
it will always be under IGST. It will always be under IGST. It is always RCM, always IGST. All the other cases that you have discussed, I have always shown you that it can be under RCM, it can be under, but here it is always RCM, it is always IGST. All other cases can be RCM, can be FCM. It can be CGST, SGST, it can be IGST. But this is always RCM and always IGST. Always IGST. Now the next case here, we are talking about renting of residential dwelling. Renting of residential dwelling. Now when you talk about renting of residential dwelling, renting of residential dwelling, if it is, if it is, used for residence not used for residence it is used for residence not used for residence right and if the recipient is recipient is registered person recipient is unregistered person recipient is registered person recipient is unregistered person Sign right, recipient is unregistered person, recipient is registered person. In all the cases, renting of residential dwelling used for residence by unregistered person is exempt. Normally, everyone might be staying in residential house which is taken on renting. This renting of residential dwelling used for residence. We are not talking about registered person because we are talking about our family being saying that this unregistered person exempt. If it is renting of residential dwelling used for residence and and recipient is recipient is registered person. Is it possible? First of all, first doubt will be: is it possible? Who will take a house which is for residential purposes, used for residence, and it is taken by registered person. It is highly possible if you understand staff quarters by a company, guest house by a company. When I tell company, it need not be company. It can be proprietorship, concern, partnership firm, LLP. Isn't it? Isn't it? Staff quarters taken by an entity, business entity or guest house taken by a business entity. It's all covered here. Correct? Correct. Now, is it taxable? Yes. Under? RCM. If renting of residential dwelling is there, not used for residence. Not used for residence. Now you'll have to. So how is this called? That is a residential dwelling, but not used for residence. Lot of examples. That is a CA firm operating at a house. Or there is a house which is taken for shooting a movie or shooting a serial. Or warehouse purposes, business purposes. It's not used for residence. When you watch a movie, there will be houses taken there. When you watch series, there are big, big houses. Even by a so-called poor family, the house will be excellent. Correct. Now, these are renting of residential dwelling taken by the production house. Not used for residence. Is it taxable? Now, don't ask whether it is, whether the recipient is registered or unregistered does not make any sense. It is always taxable because it is not used for residence and it is under excellent scenario to end this. One is exempt, one is taxable under RCM, one is taxable under FCM. By the way, service is the same. By the way, service was same. Renting of residential dwelling. One category exempt, one category RCM, one category FCM. Exempt RCM and FCM. Everything is covered here. What if your father is running a business, proprietorship concern, also taking the shop, taking a staff quarters on rent and taking your house on rent? They have clarified. If it is a proprietorship concern where it has taken two houses on rent, one is staff quarters for business, one is house for family. House for family will be covered here. Exempt. Though your father is running a proprietorship concern, he is having a GSC number. But that rent for house will not be business expenses, will be personal drawings. It is exempt. 
that staff quarters taken by your father who is running a proprietorship concern will be business expenses and he is registered for that particular business. Then that will be under RCA. That will be under RCA. So they have clarified. Why they have clarified? Because GSC number is for PAN and PAN is of your father, proprietorship concern. So when you say you are registered, you are registered for PAN. But they still clarified that no, that house taken for family, though that person is registered, but he is paying that for personal expenses, still exempt. And staff quarters taken for business where he is registered, now it is taxable under RCA. Taxable under RCA. So that is, that is everything about your renting of residential dwelling services. Are you guys clear with this understanding? The last then the final part being your importation of services. Last and the final part being your importation of services. In importation of services, you need to correct this point. Services provided by RBI from outside India in relation to management of foreign exchange reserves, it was exempted earlier. It was exempted earlier. Now you don't have that particular exemption. Now that particular exemption is not that. It was exempted earlier. Now it is taxable. So remove this particular point. Now how to make your importation of services simple? How to make your importation of services simple? Strictly speaking, importation of services needs to be divided into three categories. But we will divide that only into two categories. For a very simple reason that third category deals with Transportation of goods by vessel at the time of importation of goods which is overruled by a Supreme Court judgment in case of Mohit Meral. So we are not going to discuss that third category because now it has been overruled. So now we are not going to discuss that third category. We will divide this into two simple category. One normal, one OIDARS, online information and database access and retrieval services online information and database access and retrieval services one normal and one special in normal there is a particular list and then you have balance category then you have balance category there is a particular list which is always exempt what is that list see importation of services make one thing very clear there are three conditions which are satisfied. Location of supplier outside India. Location of recipient in India. Place of supply in India. So that is satisfied. That you have to be very, very clear. That is the definition of importation of services. Supplier outside India, recipient in India, place of supply in India. Now, that particular list contains, if at all, importation of services is by Section 12 AAA or AB entity for charitable purposes, it is exempt. It is exempt. If importation of services is of online journals and periodicals by colleges, category B educational institutions. There are three categories of educational institution: category A, category B, category C. We are only talking about category B. We are only talking about category B. First category is preschool education or education up to higher secondary school or equivalent. Second is education for obtaining a qualification recognized by law for the time being in force. Third is skill development courses. So, we are talking about second category. Category B. Category B. Third, royalty or license fees which is already subject to customs duty. If it is already subject to customs duty, again, GSC will not come, which is already subject to customs duty. Fourth, you are talking about your import by United Nations or international organizations. Import by United Nations or international organizations for official use. Fifth, import by foreign diplomatic mission or consular offices or their diplomats or their officers. For official use as well as personal use. Either by the embassy or their employees. Either by the 
embassies or their employees. Official use or personal use. This list, this list will not attract GST. Import by 12AA or 12AB for charitable purposes. Online journals and periodicals by category B educational institutions. That is, I have written it as colleges. Category B educational institutions. Colleges or uh, your universities or even your professional courses. So, uh, better I will write category B educational institutions. Category B educational institutions. Royalty license fees if it is already subject to customs duty. United Nations international bodies for official use. Import by foreign diplomatic mission, carrier consular officers, that is embassies and their employees, diplomats and the officers for official use or for personal use. It is exempt. Balance category. Balance category. If it is not covered anywhere here. If it is not covered anywhere here. Now, why I am writing this as balance category? Because OIA DRS categorization is just like this. Directly balance category. Now, in balance category, you have to ask yourself a question whether it is for non-business entities or business entities. In OIDRS language, this non-business entity is called as non-taxable online recipient. Roughly, it is nothing but non-business entity which is not registered. Same thing, it is non-business entity. If you the, see the meaning of non-taxable online recipient, it means you are not talking about a business entity. You are not talking about a business entity. Same thing. Same thing. Technical word is non-taxable online recipient for OIDRS. It is a recipient which is non-taxable. Why it is non-taxable? Because it is not doing any business activity. Non-business entity. And you are talking about business entity. To be very, 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 very specific, this non-business entity as well as non-taxable online recipient is defined to include government or individuals. It covers both government as well as individuals which are getting these services not for business, not for profession, not for commerce, not for industry. It does not only covers individuals, it also covers government. Government or individuals and exactly you will find the same in both the places. Non-business entity is not defined, but the conditions are defined. Whereas non-taxable online recipient is defined. And how it is defined? Government, individual, not using for business, profession, commerce or industry. Finally, in net effect, you understand that they are talking about the same thing. They are talking about the same thing. <laughs> now, what is the difference? If it is normal import of services, if it is normal import of services, OIDRS import of services is different. Normal import of services imported by a non-business entity exempt. exempt. But if it is import, uh, normal import of services imported by business entity, it is taxable under RCM. Normal import of services by non-business entity exempt. By business entity taxable under RCM. If it is not registered, compulsory registration under section 24. Now, to the for OIDR services from a person outside India. How I have decided that this OIDR supplies is outside India? Why not in India? If it is in India, it is not importation of services. If it is in India, technically it is not importation of. So it is only a question of FCM. If I tell it is importation of services, it is clearly implied that supplier is outside India. Recipient is in India. Place of supply is in India. If it is supplied to non-taxable online recipient, classic example, all the apps that you are using. At times there will be paid apps. We may not download it, but there are paid apps which will pay. Supplier is outside India. Supposing the app creator is outside India, you are the recipient. Will GSC be there? Yes. No exemption. No exemption for OIDRS category. But GSC will be there and GSC will be paid by... By whom? Supplier of OIDARS who is sitting outside India. You are asking someone who is sitting outside India to pay 
GAC. For that reason, the registration process for OIDRS is simple. Normal UK take one state, one registration, but for OIDRS is full India, one registration. They are not required to file normal returns. They are required to file a simplified automated return, automated return GSCR 5A. Everything is simple for them because they are person who's, who are actually outside India. Who are actually outside India. What if it is OIDRS services, importation of services by a business entity? By a business entity, it is the same. Taxable under. Don't you think that few apps will be downloaded or paid by architects, interior decorators, engineers, which is for business purposes? Why go to them? Even by professions like us. Correct. When we are entering into the world of artificial intelligence, don't you think that there will be a lot of paid apps helping us out to do it? Why not take any other example? I'll take our examples. For our academy, we have taken 3-4 apps. They are all paid apps. For storage purposes, we have Backblaze. Right. For PDF alignment purposes, we have I love PDF. These are all paid apps. All of them are Paid apps. When we record these expenses, what we have to do? This is all RCM. This is all RCM. That's a bunny CDN app. So even within our academy, we have three, four apps, which is which are all paid apps, which are all outside here. This recording which is happening. Are all paid apps. When you're all talking about paid apps, what will happen? The creator may be outside India. This is all OIDR services outside India. Imported by whom? Business entity. Business entity. Therefore, it will be under RCA. It will be under all under RCA. Clear? Are we clear with this understanding? There is no difference to the extent of import of normal services by business entity, OIDR services by business entity, because both are covered under RCA. The difference lies where if import is of normal services by non business entity, it is exempt. But if import is of OIDRS services, online information database access and retail services by a non business entity, technically called as non taxable online recipient, it is nothing but non business entity, then it is not exempt. It is taxable, that too it is taxable under FCM. Who will pay? A person who is sitting outside India is required to pay to Indian government. Is required to pay to Indian government. So that is everything about your importation of service. Make your life simple. Split it. Normal OIDRS. Is there any third category of importation of services? Yes. There is a third category. Even in your uh, text, you can remove that particular third category. That third category as of now is not relevant. Why? This third category as of now is not relevant. The third category is even separately on the next page. On the Next page, you will find a note. Supreme Court in case of Moit Minerals have said that this entry is not valid, therefore no GSC. You will find that in the next page. This is the third category of special importation of services. So that is one normal, two special. Normal we have discussed, one special we have discussed OIDRS, that is another special. Importation of transportation services when transportation is by way of vessel at the time of goods being imported in India. But that has been that has been overruled by Supreme Court. It has been said that this entry is ultra virus. The act. It is ultra virus. You cannot ask a third person. It's neither the supplier nor the recipient. So you are not required to see this particular entry. Now, if you see the total number of entries that we have seen, 23 in effect. 21 were already covered, which were applicable both for CGSC, AGSC, and IGST. Importation of services only with respect to IGC. In importation of services, two categories, normal and normal and OIDS. Now, if you see all these 73 entries, what we have done, we have made sure that we have linked your corresponding exemption and RCM, which also makes your exemption division very simple. Now, you know that exemption need not be by added, RCM needs to be by added. You have to be very clear. Balance exemption which is not good. Just give a glance. Don't try to buy at it. Give a glance and understand the logic and close it. The moment you start by adding the exemption entries, life will be very, very difficult. You will find the exemption huge. But if you are giving a glance 
unlike your RCM, you are not required to remember exemption entries. You are just required to see whether this entry was there in the exemption or not. If yes, it is exempted. If no, it is not exempted. RCM to specifically remember when RCM and when FCM. So that is all about your RCM read along with your exemption. Now, talking about your section 9.5. Section 9.5 talks about a situation where it is neither RCM nor FCM. Neither supplier will pay tax under FCM nor recipient will pay tax under RCM. It is a third party. Electronic commerce operator will pay tax on behalf of both supplier and recipient. Now, when you talk about who is electronic commerce operator, defined in section 245 of CGC Act, a person who, a person who owns, manages or operates, person who owns, manages or operates digital or electronic facility or platform. In simple language, websites or apps. Websites or apps for doing what? For doing electronic commerce. For doing electronic commerce. In simple language, you are talking about online platforms. Online, whether they are working through website or apps. And by the way, we are talking about whom? Online platforms who are promoting business of other persons. Like your Amazon, Flipkart. These are all good sector. Now, service sector, you will have Ola. Uber, Swiggy, Zomato, Make My Trip, etc. A lot of apps are there, right? Promoting business of other, rather they are having services or goods of other persons on their platform. On their platform. Now, what is covered in section 9.5 is not goods, is not all services, is only four notified services through ECO. I'll Make it more clear, if I am supplying goods through Amazon, Section 9.5 does not attract. If I am server, supplying services through an online platform, by default, Section 9.5 does not come into picture. It does not come into picture. It will come into picture only when I am supplying four notified services through ECO. What are the four notified services? Passenger transportation services. A classic example where a supplier is supplying passenger transportation services through ECO. Ola, Uber, even when you are talking about two wheelers, Rapido. Ola, Uber, Rapido, etc. Right. Supplier is the cab owner. But who is the facilitator? Ola, Uber or Rapido. Next, your accommodation services. Classic example, Trivago, as I make my trip. These are all examples where you book the hotel rooms through online platforms. But they are not actually, they are not actually owning any hotels, accommodation services. Next, you are talking about housekeeping services. Urban Club started fastly in metro cities, now going to other cities as well. Right. So, what is happening when you talk about, say, uh, taking a plumbing services or carpentry services to Urban Club? Urban, urban Club does not employ plumbers, carpenters, etc. They are just a platform where you need a carpenter and there is a carpenter already ready. They are only a facilitator. They are only a facilitator. And restaurant services. What is the classic example when you talk about restaurant services? Swiggy, Zomato. I mean, they have said a Benchmark, the moment we talk about, the moment we talk about restaurant services to online platforms, the first thing that will come in every person's mind is Swiggy Zomato. That is the worth, worth of a brand value. You know, what was the first brand that was created long back in India, but still it's there in the mind of the people? Xerox. It is photocopy. Xerox was a brand name. Now, people have got that brand name in their mind so much. That whenever you go to a photo copy shop, what do you learn? Four Xerox. That's a brand. That's a that's the worth or the value of the brand. Now, talking about these four services, only if these four services are supplied through eco, that'll be section 95. Where 
neither supplier will pay nor recipient will pay it will be third party who is going to pay with who's the third party online platform electronic commerce operator but wait the problem with 93 rcm or 94 rcm or 95 eco people just remember the headings and they always think that it is always 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 93 rcm category or 94 rcm category or 95 eco category it's not so let us try to understand it when you talk about passenger transportation service you are booking passenger transportation service via say ola uber or rapido it may be radio taxi where there is a centrally controlled office and it is controlling everyone to gps gprs or motor cab you are talking about 1 to 6 passenger or maxi cab 6 to 7 to 12 passengers or a normal motorcycle two wheeler even two wheeler is there or any other motor vehicle which means you need not remember any terms you are talking about any motor vehicle except except omnibus but wait even omnibus is covered omnibus is covered separately except when the person who supplying that service through omnibus say for example red bus you are booking a bus seat through red bus red bus is only an app now that bus owner if at all the bus owner company is a company bus owner supplier is a company then 95 will not apply then 95 will not apply otherwise even 95 will apply for omnibus now how to understand this supposing you are booking supposing you are booking a cab through ola it's normal thing right it is covered by radio taxi motor cab maxi cab or motorcycle motor vehicle it is covered in normal category correct in that case who's the supplier cab owner who's the recipient you guys rider but who's going to pay tax who's going to pay tax ola is going to pay tax please understand that ola generally gets a commission but now ola will pay tax not on its commission but on the entire fare supposing the ride amount is 1000 rupees ola's commission is 100 normally ola would have paid the tax on 100 but now ola will pay tax on entire 1000 entire it will not again pay tax on 100 rupees 1000 rupees includes commission ola will now pay tax on entire entire 1000 eco category eco category now if i change the example supposing you are booking a bus seat in kpn travels through red bus through red bus and and this kpn travels is it a company no kpn travels so it is not a company it is not if it is a company it should have limited private limited or limited so supplier is not a company eco will be applicable yes what will happen now now supplier kpn travels will not pay gst recipient rider will not pay gst who will pay gst third party Red bus eco will pay GST not on its commission but on the entire fare on the entire fare eco category. It is not going to pay on commission. Supposing right charges is thousand rupees, commission of red bus is hundred. Normally red bus should have paid on hundred, but now red bus is paying on entire thousand. Red bus main supply is only hundred rupees, but it is now paying GST on entire thousand rupees. Now to make you understand this better way, to take the last example. Supposing you are booking a bus seat of in KPN Travels Private Limited. KPN Travels Private Limited through Red Bus. Now whether the supplier is a company. Whether supplier is a company. Yes. It is a category of Omnibus. Please understand when you talk about your radio taxi, motor cab, maxi cab or you are talking about motor cycle. Right? Radio taxi, motor cab, maxi cab, motorcycle there or any other motor vehicle there it can be a supplier can be a company supplier cannot be a company no issues but when companies we learned omnibus bus category for bus category if supplier is a company it will take care of itself if supplier is not a company eco will take care now in this case supplier itself is a company now you understand the real picture actually there are two contracts kpn travels and the rider kpn travels private limited and the rider red bus and kpn travels private limited now, KPN Travels will pay GST on the basic fare. Will pay GST on the basic fare. It is not eco case, it is FCM case. It is not eco case, it is FCM case. And Red Bus also will pay GST, but only on its commission. 
to put in a simple terms what was the numbers that we took travel charges is 1000 commission is 100 kpn travels private limited will pay gc on 1000 rupees if the rider is eligible for credit it will take the credit red bus will pay gc on 100 rupees commission and kpn travels private limited will take the credit will take the credit both are fcm category there were two contracts which are made as one by eco which are made as one by eco now kpn travels private limited will pay gc on 1000 rupees rider if he is eligible for credit if it is a business true the come the rider will take the credit second contract red bus will pay gsc on its commission 100 rupees and who is the recipient for red bus recipient for red bus commission will be collected from whom kpn travels private limited kpn travels private limited will take the input tax credit will take the input tax credit are you guys clear with this understanding so don't make a mistake of seeing the question telling that there is a passenger transportation service through eco then it is always 95 no first of all people don't even understand 95 95 is a scenario where a third party eco comes and pays gsc on behalf of supplier eco is liable to pay gsc but only on its commission but now eco pays the gsc on the main amount on the main amount now second and third case they are similar accommodation services and housekeeping services 95 is applicable basically accommodation services uh, where you talk about accommodation by way of hotels inns guest house clubs campsites etc for residential or lodging purposes even the same is true for housekeeping services where you're talking about housekeeping services such as plumbing carpeting etc through electronic commerce operator but 95 will not be applicable in what case if supplier himself is a big person if the supplier is himself is liable for registration under if supplier himself is liable for registration under section 22 which means suppliers aggregate turnover is more than 20 lakhs or 10 lakhs why i have not taken 10 lakhs why i have not taken 10 lakhs because it is service why i have not taken 40 lakhs sorry why i have not taken 40 lakhs because it is service for service sector what is it under? either 20 lakhs or if supplier himself is a big person his turnover himself is more than 20 lakhs or 10 lakhs then no eco supplier will take care of himself fcm fcm category now let us understand this also supposing you are booking you are booking a room of muttu hotel which is not liable for registration muttu hotel is a small hotel not liable for registration through Trivago. Supposing room accommodation charges 1000 rupees, Trivago commission is 100 rupees. Now, Trivago will pay GST on entire 1000 rupees, eco category. Eco category. But if I change the example and I tell that you are booking hotel of, booking a room of Taj Hotel through Trivago. Now, Taj Hotel is obviously liable for registration. Its turnover is more than 20 lakhs and lakhs. Now what will happen? 9 by is not applicable. 9 by is not applicable. Same 1000 rupees, same 100 rupees. Let us not change that. Now who will pay what? Taj Hotel will pay GST on 1000 rupees. Accommodation charges, FCM case. Trivago will pay GST but only on its, not on 1000 rupees, only on its commission 100 rupees, FCM case. Taj Hotel will pay GST. If the recipient is eligible for credit, it will take. Trivago will pay GST on its commission. Obviously, Taj Hotel will take the input tax credit because it is used for its business. So there are two supplies, Taj Hotel to the main person who is staying there and Trivago to Taj Hotel. Trivago to, Trivago is going to collect commission from whom? Taj Hotel. Trivago will pay GST on 100 rupees. Taj Hotel will take the credit. Taj Hotel will pay GST on 1000 rupees. If the customer, if the main Recipient is eligible for credit, it will take the credit. Both are FCM case. Both are FCM case. The same way, think of housekeeping services. Remember the scenario when Hardik Pandey and KL Rahul went to coffee with Karan? Carpenter. Hardik, now Hardik Pandey's situation is only like that. Right? This example was drafted long back, but today's scenario it is more relevant. More relevant. Booking of a carpenter, Hardik Pandya, who is not liable for 
registration through urban club carbon ding charges is 1000 rupees urban club commission is 100 rupees now whether hardik pandya is small or big very small true hardik pandya is very small what will happen urban club will pay gst on entire 1000 rupees carbon ding charges eco category but if at all i change the example and tell that you are booking a carpenter kl rahul who is liable for registration his registration is more than 20 his turnover is more than 20 lakhs 10 lakhs and you are taking his services through urban club whether kl rahul is small or big comparatively big right now eco or not covered by eco it is the 95 or no 95 no 95 because supplier himself is big now it will be split into two now KL Rahul will pay GST on its carpenting charges that is housekeeping services 1000 rupees FCM category and Urban Club will also pay GST but only on its commission 100 rupees. So Urban Club will pay GST on commission 100 rupees KL Rahul will take the credit. KL Rahul will pay GST on its carpenting services 1000 rupees. If the recipient is eligible for credit it will take the credit. It will take the credit. Are you guys clear this understanding? And finally, 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 restaurant services. Restaurant services. Supply of restaurant services other than other than supply through a specified premises, which means you are supplying restaurant services in normal other than specified premises. Now, what do you mean by specific? Normally, if at all you are ordering from Swiggy or Zomato, who will pay GSC? Swiggy Zomato. But wait, that is an exception. Here also there is an exception. If at all, that restaurant which is finally giving you the food is a specified premise. What do you mean by specified premise? Specified premise means a premise which contains hotel plus restaurant. Pure restaurant will come here. Hotel plus restaurant also will come here. But a small hotel will come here. But if it is a big hotel, what is hotel? Hotel means accommodation. Restaurant means food. So, what is normally covered? If it is only restaurant, 9-5. Hotel and restaurant, but small hotel, 9-5. Hotel and restaurant, big hotel. What is the definition of big hotel? Big hotel means at least there should be one room where the declared tariff value is more than 7,500 per day per room. Per unit means per room. Per day per room. Are you getting that? Only restaurant, 9-5. Restaurant hotel, but small hotel, 9-5. Restaurant hotel, but big hotel. Single room. There should not be many rooms. Even if there is one room whose declared tariff value is more than 7,500 per room per day, then no 9-5. Please, you are big enough. You take care of yourself. You take care of yourself. Now, let us see that. Ordering. Ordering food of Kali Pet restaurant through Swiggy. There's a restaurant called as Kali Pet. Empty stomach. Right. Translation Kali Pet restaurant through Swiggy. Now, who will pay? It's a pure restaurant. 9 5 will be there. Supposing your restaurant amount is 1000 rupees. Commission of Swiggy is 100 rupees. Now, Swiggy will pay GC on what? Swiggy will pay GST on entire restaurant service, not on commission, eco category, eco category. But if I change the question, ordering food of Taj Hotel. Now it is restaurant with hotel, restaurant with hotel and that restaurant with hotel, hotel is a big hotel, which means at least there is one room whose Declared tariff value, whose room tariff value is more than 7,500 rupees per day per room, per day per unit, which means per day per room. Then, whether Swiggy will help or Taj Hotel will help itself. So, what will happen? Same, 1,000 rupees restaurant and 100 rupees commission of Swiggy. Now, what will happen? Taj Hotel will pay GSC on food services, restaurant services, 1,000 FCM case. FCM case and Swiggy will also pay GSC but only on its commission FCM case. That's it. That's everything, everything, everything about your section 95.
where neither supplier pays GAC nor recipient pays GAC, third person pays GAC, but do not have a confusion that just remembering the heading will help you out. Passenger transportation services or uh, you are talking about accommodation services, housekeeping services, restaurant services, no. In all the four examples, I have shown you a case where it will not be covered by section 9.5. It will not be covered by section. This is equally true with RCM. You cannot read the heading of RCM and decide that it is section 9.3. No. You should know what is the exact condition. So, that is everything about your section 9.5.